Hello, Yeshua Network. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome, you guys, to another entire Bible read-through. Woohoo! <laughs> so, hey, everybody, welcome. As everybody's logging on, I'm going to do my little, uh, my little uh, kind of uh, lead-in here with some updates about Yeshua Official, uh, our Facebook page, and the events we have going on. We are looking at doing a Nashville meetup uh, here in 2023. So if you're watching this video recorded, you can always check out our link pinned to the top of the Yeshua official Facebook page. Uh, it is made by subscribers just like you, and we thank them for their hard work and their dedication because they are on it, and they do a lot of work to get all that information streamlined in a very easy-to-find place. So just just shout out to those guys. I don't know if they want to be recognized or not. Sometimes they get mad at me for pointing them out, but you know who you are. We all know who you are. And we are very, very grateful for the hard work that you do and how you have all, by your contribution to the entire Bible read through, uh, be the light for your day holiness challenge, all those things with your comments and questions and, and all that. You guys have made this ministry deeply more. And the Father has blessed us all because you have stepped out of your comfort zones and you have reached out and, and made yourself a part of our family here at Yeshua Network. I personally am inter eternally grateful for you. Uh, so go ahead and check out that link because it will have all the information um, on where you can sign up and also the Israel meetup uh, in the fall. Uh, what else? Oh, and we also have the ministries that we're supporting outside, like, you know, off the Internet. Um, we have the children, the orphans and, and foster kids and the, and the families that have like lost their homes because of fire or tornado or things like that. Um, the We have a. Uh, multiple uh, GoFundMes that we, we do as we go along per the needs of what's out there. And we just posted another one uh, and some, and we're already at one third of the way through to get that going. So I'm going to be doing updates and meeting with those folks, hopefully this next coming week uh, so that we can actually get all the things done um, that we need to get for them. They're, they're pretty excited to hear that uh, we're back on the horse ever since, you know, my issues uh, in the last month. So you're getting back on the horse. So again, thank you guys also for all of your patience with me personally. I do want to just shout that out and take a moment real quick at the beginning of this video and just say thank you, everybody. One who has lifted me up in prayers, continue to be patient with me and support this ministry, even though I've been super MIA. Um, I, I, I needed the time. I'm feeling better every day. Uh, the devil is attacking. And I think I have an amazing testimony that I look forward to sharing with you guys. Uh, I feel like it's, it's, a, a beautiful thing that the Lord is doing in my life. Um, and uh, I, I just want to say thanks before we start. I, I feel super, super blessed by you. So thank you all very much. All right, that's it. I'm sure there's more, but you guys can check out all our groups and all that stuff to, to see the updates. So, yeah. Ooh, and of course, we have, we have the world famous Alex Lebowski, uh amazing voice narrator rock star here with us wow. as well. So, wow. yeah, see, there it is. Look at that. Look at that radio. He's got the microphone like right. Look at it. You can see it right at the bottom of the screen. See a little fuzzball. I've, I've got I've got all kinds way. of I've got all kinds of effects on it. Normally I sound like this. I can't say you do it. But yeah, you that's know. his real voice. You guys yeah. don't know that unless you've been to a meetup. He sounds like Papa Smurf. You know. Hey guys. Just kidding. He told me. Hi doesn't. guys. You know I turn okay. on the bass and the. <clears throat> um. Okay. Well, after that introduction, now that I'm yes. blushing right through my earphones here um mm. let's get started yeah let's do um it. ellen ellen kozar hermanson i hope i got your name right forgive me if not nathan i liked how you addressed at last ebrt that we might not have free will only free choice reflecting on it the prayer you will be your will be done on earth as it is in heaven came to mind when you surrender to christ it becomes about his will and if you're one with him, then you can't separate the two. We have a choice, but it's more about the choice to surrender to his will. And then no longer your will. It's then no longer your will. If God hardens hearts, it seems it's because seeds of pride and jealousy or selfishness are already in you, but you choose to act on it. He doesn't tempt anyone. It's our own evil desire, James 1, 13 and 14. 
He will redeem it and use our shortcomings for his purpose because he made us. Might seem like some are created for destruction, but how God will redeem everything in the end, only he knows. Damn. It's a good word there, Alan. Thank yeah. you for sharing that. Absolutely. Very nice. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, we have also, before we to get started on, on chapter four here, we have uh, from Gilda, we have a, a one from last week that was missed. It's chapter three. Uh, it's like a general comment, I think. Yeah. And it's, uh, she says, once again, the prideful and self-righteous are eager to condemn Yeshua for not conforming to their work-based laws. They feel it is wrong to heal someone on Sabbath. It is considered working. Uh, it is considered... My, my eyes are almost up. Yeah, working. Yeshua wants them to realize that Sabbath is about relationship with him and being with his within his will. Not what works you do or don't do. It was created for us to spend time with our creator. He wants them to realize that Yeshua is Messiah himself, and therefore he is Lord over Sabbath. I think the barrier and blatant disconnect here is pride. Pesky, ever alive sin of pride, which grows in all of us if we don't uproot it daily. From the 40 day holiness challenge, we know that the antidote to pride is surrender. Surrender to God and his will and his will alone. The pride of the Pharisees is so strong and so thick that they can't even see Messiah right in front of them. We are all Pharisee like on the regular. We too don't recognize it a lot of the time. There's more concern, we're, they're more concerned with pointing out uh, discrepancy within their law that they follow, insinuating that the works ha have more merit than relationship. Imagine fantasizing about destroying someone who healed a person on the wrong day. What type of insanity would cause that pride and self-righteous ego? The demise of everyone. This chapter got me thinking about what God really wants from us. Does he want someone to follow strict rules and guidelines to a T, to condemn anyone around them who doesn't do this? Does he want meticulous rule? We believe that intellectual familiarity with God is the most important thing. Or does he want a real relationship with us where we know him? He truly knows us too. Reminds me of the depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I, I never knew you. The Phar Pharisees clearly know God intellectually, but they don't know him intimately because he literally is right in front of them and they don't realize it. In fact, they find fault with him. I think this world tricks us a lot into believing that rituals and works are what make God pleased with us. I think that's yet another well-crafted lie of the enemy. When we are led down a worker works-based path, and there's a tablespoon of pride thrown in that recipe. Soon we find ourselves so far away from him that we can no longer even hear or see him. I think pride is actually the yeast that, that blows us super fast, that blows up super fast and out of control. And then the enemy sits back and that his mission was accomplished. If you think not lighting a fire or ignoring those in need on Sabbath is making God happy, you're sadly misled. If you think analyzing everyone around you and pointing out the speck in everyone uh, else's eye is what makes God happy, you're probably blind to the truth. The religious leaders here exemplify the boastful pride of life. They're the poster children for it. If there was a billboard on the 101 that showcased pride, these dudes' faces would be on it. Mine would be too when I'm not stalking myself. But they can't see it because the enemy has million blindfold manufactured by Pride Inc. <laughs> by Pride Inc. that he distributed to everyone, just like the government distributes masks to all of us. It makes me feel like setting an alarm on my iPhone for every hour that chimes with the alert, check your pride, God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. Let's check put your pride, G. I G. Maybe, I maybe, know, yeah. maybe it was a street slang. I is like... I think it was. Yeah. I just put Jesus in God. I thought maybe she just didn't finish I like, it. Yeah. I, I like that too. Both ways yeah. work. Because she did yeah. put it in the big, big capital G. Mm -hmm. Great. That was I guess great. it would be if it was just G too, though. Yeah, thank comment. you. That was a good comment. And yes. Yeah. Worst, right. The worst of all sins, the one that scares me beyond all wind is pride. I, 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 if there's a Sin, I was authentically scared of its pride because 
prideful. That's how good the sin of pride is. So, right? yeah, um, you, your your mic cuts out every once in a while. There's a word that gets swallowed here and there. I didn't. You're wanna... blanking. Am I blanking now? Yeah, was I blanking? Yes. Oh, you're blanking too. Now, guys, if you are getting it on your end, if you're seeing us blank, or if there's yeah. words being cut out, yeah, no, yeah, Ricardo's saying sounds like a loose cable. Oh, um, well, because not I, because you were blanking too. I was going to tell you. Well, it might be your earpiece, because I might not be no, blanking was... here. No, you were. You were doing it before we started. I meant to tell you before we went live. Right, but I'm saying, I'm saying. Because you're listening to me talk on your earpiece the whole time, right? No, I was listening to you on the phone in the beginning, though, remember? On the phone? Before I put, oh. yeah, on my on my phone, my camera phone, before got it, got I it. before I put my earpiece in. Okay, so there's uh, potentially something with the signal. I, yeah, you're you're good right now, but I it's I think it's maybe your computer's overloaded. Perhaps are you having something else running? It's not no. computer kind of thing. No, I have no, no idea. No, I just uh, it might be an internet connection deal. Yeah, I've shut down everything except for this whole deal, and the computer can certainly handle that. You sound very good right now. Okay. Yeah, All right, well, yours cut, cut out a little bit just now, too. But um, let's keep going, guys. If it continues to be a problem, we might uh, try to fix Reboot it. Reboot or something? Yeah. Okay. Um, Listen, tech problems. Nathan Wheeler, it's a thing. If you've been around for 10 years, you know, it's a thing. So welcome. <laughs> welcome. Yeah. The enemy likes to attack, I think, your tech problems with us. Yep. Um, right, Ricardo, I'm with you on that one. Usually low bandwidth breaks video first. Since its video is working, it's, it sounds like some kind of earpiece audio device issue. So we'll just keep going. Hopefully it ironed itself out. Um, okay, Mark 4, Jennifer Connolly. Mark 4, 1. Again, Yeshua began to teach by the lake. Uh, the crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out um, out and sat in it out on the lake while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. This always amazes me because he was able to utilize these conditions for his purpose. Knowing all things, he chose in nature the perfect spot in the boat. Sound travels over water very easily, even reaching to the people very far away so all could hear the message ancient natural technology he used elements in his creation to create an amphitheater so all could hear amazing he that have ears let them hear <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah so awesome i know it's so awesome when i just imagining the scene yeah. and imagine being in the boat with him man oh man you know what i mean like yeah what gosh what a glorious feeling that must have been you don't yeah. know. You may not know what he's saying yet. You may not know who he is, but you know, man, I'm glad I'm in the boat, right? <laughs> if you're if you're in the boat with him, yeah, yeah. You, you may not understand everything he's saying, but yeah, you're yeah. you're like, I'm in this boat, and this is amazing. I'm, <laughs> this is just what's going on here, right? Exactly. Now. Exactly. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Jill Higgins says, "Oh, they that have ears, let them hear. Plant your thoughts on good soil and shoot up healthy minds." Love the parable. Yeah. I, this is uh, I think this is one of the Christian staples, right? The parable of the sowing of the seeds. It's, yeah, and I mean it's it's throughout the whole rest of the New Testament too. Like totally, must uh, yeah, 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 pretty awesome. Uh, Gilda, Mark chapter four, general comment: uh, the parable of the seed growing is referring to the spread and span of time, and how one day God is going to come and Yeshua is going to have a second coming, obviously, and reap the followers that are here and remake the world. Then he gives the parable of the mustard seed. This is basically saying that the initial faith you gain about salvation may seem like something that is a small change at first, but over time it's going to grow and grow and grow, and you're going to reach out and disciple other people and maybe help them with being saved. And you're going to produce fruit, such as being more charitable and kind to people. And that is going to be branches that then spread the good news and those people are going to spread the good news after you spread it to them and it just becomes an ever-growing plant then the storm happens and the disciples freak out like i would do and they've 
uh, and they've already seen Yeshua heal people and seen so many miracles, and yet they still have a lack of faith when they're put into danger. Because when your life is at stake or your precious child is sick and suffering, that is when the true test of faith comes. And even many of the disciples of Yeshua weren't at all level of faith yet, uh, weren't at that level of faith yet, and that's why he criticizes them and tells them everything was going to be okay, and that he was literally sleeping, and that's how sure and confident he was that everything was fine. What a lesson and goal to strive for, such faith. To be able to lay down and sleep on a bed of pure faith when terrifying life circumstances arise. I want that level of faith so badly. I'm closer to it than I've ever been, though. So hallelujah for that, and all glory to him for opening that dusty door for me when I finally knocked on it after 40 years of wandering around on rocky ground and thorns. Amen, Amen. Gilda. Amen. Uh, Jennifer Connolly, and some fell among the thorns, Mark 4, 7. Uh, some fell along the thorns, and thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And others fell on ground around and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased and brought forth some 30, some 60, and some 100. When I read this, I can honestly say I think I have been every one of these at one point or another in my life. I feel like withered and died spiritual deaths in my life, but God kept calling. It is in reading his word that the nourishment thrives and keeps us alive. If you step away from it and truly do not abide in it, you will wither. But if you hear the word and accept it, you will bear fruit. Romans 7, 4. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Dina Christus responds to Jennifer. She says, yep, this one resonated with me too, especially when Yeshua explained it further in Mark 4, 18 and 19. Oh, we just got cut out. You did? Yeah. Am I back? You're back. Reread the, the starting of the quote. Mark 4. Okay. Mark 4, 18 and 19. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things entering in choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. I think it's a daily struggle to pick up the Bible and read it without being drawn in and distracted by other things whether that be world events, social media feeds, or life itself. I couldn't tell you the number of times I'm about to start reading and then the phone rings, or I get a text, or if I'm reading online, I will get a notification. I keep telling myself it will only take a minute to check, then one hour later, I'm still scrolling through my messages. It's a huge challenge, at least for me, to be in the world, but not of the world. My 17-year-old told me not too long ago how easy it is to get pulled into the darkness. When he gets into one of his philosophical moods, he often says, you have no idea how dark it is out there, mom. So few people know the truth. Out of the mouth of babes, huh? Yep, that is a, that is a, there's is a fountain of wisdom there from your 17 year old. Um, yeah. And it is a dark world out there. I think even more so for the youngsters, they're, they're dealing with a, they're dealing with a distribution center that the devil has that we've the world's never seen before, of course, you know, distributing it right to our eyes every second, every day at our fingertips. I mean, we all know this. It's just when you really realize it, it's insane, right? So out of this world. Yep. Yeah. Oh. There's, you know, sometimes uh, I was thinking about this today, Dina, from the, your, your, your testimony here reminded me of how, you know, you if, if can, can you guys hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. It okay. only happens for a split second. That's weird. And then, yeah. Um, uh, it, I, I was thinking today about, um, how, when, how, when God was calling out the Israelites to the wilderness to worship him, and and his his uh, his reason to save them from bondage from uh, Egypt wasn't just to so that they can have so they can be the boss. It wasn't just so that they can have their own kingdom. In fact, the actual reason he told Moses was so they can come to the wilderness and be with me. And and um, it feels like sometimes that 
our world gives us so much. The, the world gives us so much. Some of us are very blessed in that way. Um, and there's all of this, like, fun and distracting and, you know, stuff that's coming at you all the time. And just like you're pointing out, an hour later, checking the text, the wonder of modern technology, where your friends can just, or anybody can just, like, blah, and now you're reading their thoughts, is actually taking you away from spending time with the oh, Lord. Go, go back for, go back like two sentences or one sentence. Um, uh, <laughs> something, is... something spending, you, a friend texts you and then you get lost. And then the last thing we heard was spending time with the Lord. Yeah. So, uh, um, can you guys let me know if you're hearing me? Okay. I, I really yeah, want to nail down. Me? I, I have a feeling it might be the earpiece, but because it's, but I'm not sure. So, um, uh, as I was saying, that basically we have this, uh, we have all these distractions coming at us. It, it doesn't even, sometimes it feels innocent. It's just friends texting or it's people sharing about the cake they made or whatever it is that's happening on social media or in the world. Um, and, uh, okay, they're saying they hear me. It's me then, okay. Is it the earpiece? Possibly, huh? I I put in both earpieces, so let me know if it if it fixes it or not. You're in stereo. <laughs> I am in stereo. You you are literally encompassing my mind right now oh with your with with your thunderous voice. So yes, it's between me and you. So Give it is. It's got to be my... all your money, Nathan. Wait, what? Um, uh, my yes. four dollars. <laughs> yeah, I want to. My doll. two dollars. I want Give your two dollars. Anyways, okay. you guys get it. You guys get what I'm saying. I agree with you, Dina. And I think that, you know, well, oh, so my, my my point is that our bondage to the world may not feel like Pharaoh with a whip telling you to go and make bricks out of straw and build his palaces for them. Um, It may not feel that way, but are we able to go straight up anytime to the wilderness and be with the Lord? Um. Or are we constantly, are there other softer, much softer, um, uh, you know, distractions, right? Does that make sense, guys? I hope I'm making sense. It's kind of thoughts yeah. that kind of hit me today. And, um, you know, your comment, Dina, made me remember. So just wanted to well, share. Distractions are things that keep us from God isn't always torturous, abusive things. Sometimes it's the sweet comforts of life that keep us from them. If I may summarize, it, and especially with our modern comforts, it's a little bit even easier possibly for us to get get off course because we don't we're not getting whipped, right? Which is, so yeah, like, which is what he says in about the riches, right? Yeah, yeah, lot, uh, you and, know. and it is my earpieces. I can hear you going in on one and out on the other. It is my ear. So hmm. these are these are new earpieces. I don't know. They came with. I have oh, no idea. Do you know why? Are they in stereo? Yeah. It's probably there's some stereo signal from my uh, mic. So maybe if I turn my head, it now starts coming from the other one. No, it's like it goes out. Like it one goes, goes out. out. Yeah, it's something to do with these. They're charged up, so I have no idea. But we don't. It's okay. I'm I'm getting I'm getting enough. Is and it's anything I'm gonna say. Let's face it, it's not gonna be that important. So let's just uh, keep going. <laughs> Good words, my I brother. Would, I would not agree with that statement. Okay, Ricardo. Ricardo's next. Yeah, Marie Sanders Live says, yes, makes sense. I have found that I have to connect first thing in the morning with the Lord before the wor world wakes up or I miss my chance. Susan Davis says, yes, agree. It's so easy to get distracted. Yeah, I I have to give the day to the Lord before before my feet hit the ground. I ha I've, I've done it ever since I became a believer. And uh, I'm, I know there's days that I have forgotten, but... Uh, they're very far and few between. They were there was a lot in the beginning of my my walk with the Lord, and I could notice a massive difference. It's almost scary for me uh, if I miss giving the day to the Lord because I feel like just a can of whoop comes on me personally. I don't know about you guys, but that's how I feel. Uh, Ricardo, four sixteen through seventeen. Uh, and these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground who when they have heard the word immediately receive it with gladness and have and so endure a time afterwards. Uh, have no when, root in themselves. It, it cut out again. Yeah. 
Hmm. Let me try something. Hold on a sec. Might very well be my phone. Hold on a sec. Let me try this. Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. But you, you sound distant. Yeah, you sound super distant. Oh, okay. No, it sounds good now. Okay, here we go. Oh, oh no, no, it sounds distant again. Ah, no, it's uh, me. I no, it's gonna come back. It's gonna come okay. back. Okay. Give it a, yeah. Is it back? A B C. It'll. It's coming back. Watch. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Keep reading. Back. You you are back, but I just heard. I thought I just heard something cut, but. Well, well, we'll see. Listen. The sound thing with me is the weirdest. I don't know anybody else who has sound issues with their phone or their microphones like I do. It is the weirdest thing. Maybe it's my pacemaker. Maybe it's giving off like a, no, I'm just kidding. It's happening, but who knows? Okay. Uh, just make it, make your heart stop beating and then you'll read fine. I'm trying to, it won't stop. I mean, okay. obviously, okay. Right. <laughs> Wait, how should I sit? Everything is backwards. If I go this way, I don't cut Alex off. Okay. No, we're good. I'll I'll move. I'm I'm too much too close to the center. Oh, let's see. There we go. There we go. I yeah. There we go. Sorry. Technical difficulties. I meant you missed the frog. The fr <laughs> All right. I gotta stay focused. It's the frog thing. I'm I'm persuaded is the government listening to me because I've gone through three phones, and they're all the same model, but three phones and the frog thing happens just the government listening that's what i'm persuaded of okay take two mark 4 16 this is ricardo's comment and these are they that likewise which are sown on stony ground who when they have heard the word immediately receive it with gladness and have no root in themselves and so endure but for a time afterward when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake excuse me immediately they are offended same as Matthew 13, 20, 21. Slight different words in English like affliction in Matthew is translated to tribulation. The same Greek words. But even being the same Greek word, reading now the word affliction made me look, look at this sentence with a new perspective. In Matthew, my eyes went on the word root and reading the English word tribulation. This sentence made me focus on the importance of being rooted in Yeshua. The word, especially the word, especially for upcoming tribulations, does not become like this example of the seeds that fell on stony ground. This time my eyes went to the word affliction, which in Greek means pressure, the pressure of the word's sake. And it says immediately in Greek is directly. In Greek is directly. They are offended, and offended in Greek is skandolizo, which means to entrap, that is, trip up, figuratively stumble or entice to sin, apostasy or displeasure. So the pressure of the word's sake that directly stumbles. I know from my own experience on reading the Bible that some things being said were quite astonishing first time I read it, found Nathan's statements being true about many things that are not being talked about that are clearly there for anyone to read. And some things I've read at first that were also quite discouraging to read. Felt like maybe I shouldn't keep reading. Felt like my pockets were being emptied, like while being detained. Felt convicting, sometimes like this is not what I was looking for. I sort of were getting offended. I sort of was getting offended by what I was reading, I have to admit. Remembering this, now Mark's new perspective was taking shape. I remember thinking, but one thing is to seek for words that you want to hear, and another is to hear the truth. And felt to keep reading and read the whole and hoping one day it would make sense. And all this thoughts I just shared took me to two places, John 3 and, and, one, and 1 Peter 2. In John 3, Yeshua's word, it says, he that believeth on me is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son, uh, of God, God, only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth come 
tr but he that doeth truth come to the light, that his deeds may be manifest, that they are wrought in God. This is why I felt that way first time reading the Bible. My deeds were being reproved for reading God's word. And Peter said in 1 Peter 2, I forgot about this one. Thank you, Esau, for your cross-reference suggestion. He says, quote, to you who believe, then, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. The stumble because they disobey the word. And to this they were appointed. But you are chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, to proclaim the virtues of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The last sentence concentrates all that I was trying to say with too many words about the pressure of the word. He is calling us out of the darkness to proclaim the virtues of him into his marvelous light. Amen, brother. Exactly. Yeah. It's awesome. Super, super awesome. I couldn't agree more, uh, Ricardo, by the way. Um, uh, Scandaliso uh, has, a, has happened inside me more than once while reading the Bible, and it is true. Uh, we wish for it to say things. Uh, and when it says things we don't like, it's quite a Scandaliso moment. And thank God... Thank God we have the Bible and we have each other, guys, so we can process it together. That's what this fellowship is about yeah. in, in such a large part. It's, it's, it's not just about sharing the joys of the things we read and of the truth. There's also times where we have to get through all the, you know, stuff that's more difficult to swallow. And uh, I believe we're bl very blessed to have each other to be able to do that. Because, you know, that's what, what, what a structure, right? Super yeah. awesome. Gilda, um, Mark chapter 4, uh, 21. Yeshua speaks in these parables so that only people who truly want to hear what he has to say will be able to comprehend what he's saying. And those who instead have malice in their hearts are not going to be able to interpret what his message is and therefore are not going to be able to try to trick him in his words. The parable of the sower is explained by Yeshua himself and then he talks about hearing the word and how you should present it to the world. He says in verse 21 basically that when you hear the word of the good news you wouldn't want to just hide it away and keep it to yourself. You want to share it with people. You want to tell them that their sins are forgiven and that they can come to be reconciled with the Heavenly Father if they choose to repent and accept the gift of salvation. I try to remind people if I'm ever in discussions about this topic that they have free will in this decision that salvation is a gift and not and not a required mandate like a lot of things these days. Truth be told, in my circle of in-person friends, most people don't even know why salvation exists in the first place, nor what the lack of it would even mean. New Age concepts are rampant where I reside, as our people strongly uh, believe that they themselves manifest their lives. There are varying layers of veils on people's spiritual eyes, and some veils are so thick that they cannot perceive even the basics about how God designed the world, spiritual realm, life, death, and his kingdom. How could they, unless they'd read the word for themselves? How could they, unless they'd read the word for themselves? I myself knew close to 0% just a couple of years ago, and I have this feeling that I'm supposed to share what my once blind self has seen with my fellow currently blind circle of homies <laughs> all in God's timing that they're led to him someday and it's my sincere prayer that every single human being learns and follows the truth before their spirit permanently leaves their earthly flesh suit amen sister amen yeah mm -hmm. um you can't touch about that which you don't have yet or haven't experienced yet so the fact that you're reading the bible and the fact that you're studying it you know it gives you gives you that life his words are life right so mm -hmm. 
beginning stage. You gotta you gotta learn to walk before you can run. Kind of thing. So you know, very cliche, but very very true. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That, also, this video series is so important, and I know everybody here knows it, but you know, let's give praise to the fact that you know God is using a technology that is more commonly used for evil in our day and age, right? And and the ways of the world. And look at what what has been created by everybody's hard work here. Basically, as long as there's always a copy to be seen of these videos somewhere, there is an entire Bible, not just study, but like real fellowship. It's like the fact that this is recorded and people can watch it as you guys have. Gilda, you, you, you did this way behind us and you caught up and then continued to read the Bible, then came back to us again. I mean, I know there's a couple of other people about to catch up with us right now that started just a year ago and it's I I don't know I don't know if you guys have ever sat with it I think me and Alex have I know I have I've I've sat with how much of an insane blessing the work that everybody is doing and what how God is using this like EBRT is an insane level blessing like I I think it's so nice for us to experience it live but like when we think about what the legacy of what's being left behind you know it's it's really remarkable based on what you're saying, Gilda. I'm just I'm just going further with what you're saying because you're you're saying you wish you could speak more into your friends, your your life of your friends. And and I'm under the personal persuasion through my my life, as I've been a believer, the number one thing is that people get overwhelmed with the Bible and they're scared of actually reading the Bible. I don't know if there's another book on the planet that people are actually scared of reading. And if people know that they have this thing where they don't have to be scared and they don't have to worry that they're going to miss something or be too stupid or too uneducated or think the wrong thing or get made fun of for thinking the wrong thing. Like I'm, I'm persuaded the reason why there's so many people reading the Bible, you know, is because they have this fellowship and wow, the, that means that it can be for anybody. So, and I know you guys know this, I'm just giving the praise that it, it is worthy for the Lord, what he's created here. So I'll leave it. Yeah. I mean, by all, uh, you know, this is a modern technology we have for everything. So we kind of just, this is a reality for us. But if you think about the, the timelessness, I guess, the out of time experience that this, the, the EBRT it, with this tech has allowed to have, the fact that people have fellowshiped in their own time, but they still receive the blessings of fellowship and encouragement and learning and sharing. And then they kept, you know, I mean, it's, it's a miracle. It is a miracle, but by, by the standards of everybody we read about in the Bible, this is absolutely a miracle happening. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's absolutely a miracle. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for what we have. And together we built a thing that we can share. I feel confident I could share this with any individual on the planet whether they're famous and powerful and rich presidents or prime ministers or kings or queens, I, this is not a thing I would ever be ashamed of sharing with anybody. EBRT is definitely not a oh thing. Where it's, it's not like my testimonial, which is all weird and goes through the dark stuff and all that. Like this thing is so clean. What we've created here is so raw and pure to what the Bible tells us we're supposed to do. I, I absolutely feel confident in showing this to anybody on earth. And I, and I can't imagine that anybody that would at least try it. I mean, if they just got through Genesis 1 through 10, right? Anybody remembers how that starts off for us? If they just got through 1 through 10, I, I think that anybody would be like, okay, there's something here to this video series. It's very different, right? It's oh, been yeah. A yeah. And and when we say things like we've created, obviously, we're not taking credit. No. But we're saying that you know, if we, if we go back really to the discussion of will and choice, if I may use that, um, you guys have made the choice to be here, to to participate, to read, and to share your 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 hearts, your thoughts, your testimonies, your knowledge, um, and and as a result of just that willingness and that giving, God's created this thing. Um, and I know, like, you know, I think it's, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised. I, I don't want to say I know anything because I don't, I really don't. I wouldn't be surprised, though, that 
you know, even the numbers we experience in these videos are deceptive from the standpoint that this could be a massively powerful tool and we just, we have, we don't even know that yet. It hasn't yet happened. So we don't know, you know what I mean, guys? I, I don't know if that gives you anything to think about that's inspiring, but, um, it certainly has been that for all of us and it's such a blessing anyway. Yeah. Karen live says it came to me after a deep, deep devastation. I'm so grateful to the Lord. He is so faithful. He really is. He, he really is. It really is. It's unbelievable. Praise the Lord for what, what he's given, guys. This is so good. Yeah. Um, Jennifer Colley, her comment is Mark 4, 21 through 25. Quoting scripture, she says, He said to them, Do you bring in a lamp to be put under a bowl or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on, a, on its stand? For whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed, and whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. The scripture is one that I can personally testify has spurred me to try to be more vocal about my king. He will remind me and convict me of this often. My flesh would love to hide myself away in a cave with just me and the Holy Spirit <laughs> until the kingdom come. But that is not the design. And when you are a vessel full with the spirit, you need to spill on others. And when you do, you wonder why you waited so long. It is essentially what we are made for. It is truly the greatest honor and blessing. Perfect chosen words there. I couldn't agree more, Jennifer Bowen. Couldn't, could not have chosen her. This is really great. Yeah, probably. Yeah. You so, bless the blessing, amen? It's, 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 the, it's like so strange that it even is like a secret recipe, but it is. It's not a secret, but like it, 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 it seems like it is. A secret recipe in the body of Christ, right? Amen. Yeah. Cameron Peterson, Mark 422. For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. I really love this quote, and I love it in the context of the kingdom of God. I'll just ask the generic question. What does Yeshua mean here by asking this? Oh, wait, asking exactly what's the I get I guess 422 so let me read this the King James here for there's nothing hid oh uh well I think the question it's... sorry go ahead no well I'm I go I mean I don't see a question except for 421 but I think it's a rhetorical question yeah I'm I may we're not understanding you Cameron if you're live could you give a clarity because I don't know what question you're and not to be said on a candlestick. I mean, it seems very rhetorical. Like it's not really a question. It's more of like he's telling you, he's telling you what to do with your light. He's telling you to shine it. So unless you understand, Alex, I don't understand what Cameron's exactly asking. Yeah. I'm I'm not I'm not sure for I'm not exactly sure what Cameron's asking, but I was gonna just reread 422 just to see. Oh, oh okay. um, for there's nothing hid which shall not be manifested, neither was anything kept secret, but that it should come abroad. Um, I, I, you're not saying the question he asked, you're asking what does Yeshua mean by this passage 422? My bad, I did not understand. That, well, that may be, yes, that may be what Cameron's saying, but I'm not sure either because it's it sounds like I'll just ask the generic question, what does Yeshua mean here by asking this? I think basically you're trying to. I, I think Cameron, if we understand you correctly, you're asking for just a sharing and a discussion of 422. Yeah, that's um, what and what it means to us, what what people are getting from it. Um, there, there's just so many massive, massive sentences in all of these chapters, in both red letter and not. It's just you know, so like, I think if if I think if allowed we can speak for hours on any one on any one verse mm -hmm. yeah. but to, to me um i mean this is a promise that basically even though there's we are in the dark so much there there's seemingly so many mysteries and secrets in the universe that they're being kept secret and mysterious for a reason that that one day they should be revealed yeah. and that when they are revealed i trust I am to trust that it'll be for my, for, for not just for my own good, it'll be just for a great and awesome joy for everyone. 
including the maker. He wants to reveal these things to us. He made us so that all mysteries can be revealed to us. He made us in a way that the mysteries... I, I believe that he made us in a way... I don't know about all mysteries, because I don't know what I don't know. <laughs> but I do yeah. believe that he made us in a way that the mysteries we sort of are, you know, the, the truth we seek is truth we will understand, we will be given. I, I've seen, um, especially in the last several years of life on Earth here, not just, not just uh, talking about the Bible or the EBRT, but I've seen so many people in both public life and in private life seek the truth, like er, yearn for a mystery to be revealed genuinely. And as he promises in the Bible, those that knock on the door, the door will be opened. Seek and you shall find. I've seen it happen for people, and I've seen equally as much people who don't care to find out the truth completely stay locked in. And it doesn't matter if you come and you put it right there for them to look at, like a plain picture of the truth right there in front of their face. Nope, not going to see it. Don't want to see it. Uh, that's like a phenomenon we've all experienced, especially in the real world, the modern world, right? In the real world. I mean, in the modern world, because there's all this media and there's all this information. And you could totally see how people have this block. And I believe it is literally because they don't care to know. They have they have not asked the question. They have not gotten involved in, in wanting to know the truth. So seek and you shall find. So I do believe that the mystery thing, the secrets are one of those things where if you really w wish to know the truth of the Lord, if you really wish to know the truth of existence, they're going to be revealed to you and it's going to be a great and awesome thing to go from not knowing to knowing, but also to see how you got there and 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 to to know that you've 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 climbed up the rope. You were willing, you were willing to ask the question and to look I think that's going to be the thing that you could look back and say, look, I made the choice. It was hard to choose that a lot of the time. Maybe all the time it was harder to choose that than it was to just say, ah, I want my matrix steak, you know, turn off the truth, give me the steak. But, but you kept looking. And so maybe that, maybe that choice will be to our credit. Maybe that is the thing that where the Lord has designed to say, you know, you sought the truth, you've done well. Maybe so. Maybe so. Uh, Sarah does confirm that Cameron was saying that, that basically what was this passage back to me. She also says, yes, so true how some people generally seek the truth and other people have it staring in their faces, but they don't want to know it. Mary Live also says, I feel like I got a major revelation recently, but it actually, but it's actually in the Bible. It was there the whole time, but I finally got it. Yeah, it's too hard to explain here, but oh my gosh, I feel like I understand so many things now that were unclear. Yeah, it's so awesome, you guys. Uh, Tammy, a moment of revelation happens. It is a life changer. You want more. That's true. I found myself to be like addicted to learning and growing in the Lord. Yes. It literally can be like a drug for sure. And I hate that analogy because it sounds negative, but it just in the sense of like, you know, it, it literally can get addicted to like, feeding on the lord because it's so good uh gilda i feel like something usually happens to a person which then leads people to want to know the truth for me it was having to know what happens when we die because my dad was dying that led me to ndes to tmf to yeshua network to ebrt the rest is god's will the history hallelujah um hallelujah guys great live comments too i just want to just chime in real quick with matthew 4 22 i just want to say there's this passage along with one that my brother had mentioned, which is uh, seek and you shall find. And there's another passage in the book of Revelation about um, John eating scrolls in a book and it tastes sweet to his lips and then bitter in his stomach. And I've, and I, I am like enamored with that particular passage. Like it's one of the ones that like I think about a lot because I am of the persuasion that Matt, Mark 4.22 and the other ones in the Gospels that taught where he says this, for there is nothing hid 
which shall not be manifested. So I'm just going to take that chunk right there. Yeshua is saying there's a lot of things we don't know. There's infinite things we don't know. I'm taking this as Yeshua giving us probably one of the most insane, best, unbelievable, hard to fathom promises in the whole universe, which is he's saying, you're going to know everything. At some point in existence, you're going to know why everything happens. You're going to know why everything was done. And you're going to know everything of what God did and how he did it, how he, why he created what and when, where, who, all that. You're going to know it all. And so it's interesting to me as I take this passage and I and I attach it to the one that my brother had mentioned, which is knock and the door will be open to you, seek and you will find. And then I apply it to what the scrolls were that, that the prophets ate, but weren't allowed to share. They weren't allowed to tell anybody because it was only for those in that season in the end time season that they will know. And to me, those things have not necessarily been revealed just yet, which means they're still coming. But to whom will those things be revealed? Who will be the modern day prophet that the Lord will uh, just bestow that um, awareness to? Or will it be that we see it hindsight when we are in the millennia or paradise, right? So that, but it's a, to me, I'm, I'm just saying to answer the question clearly, I'm seeing this as a promise from Yeshua that's pretty remarkable. And I think it allows us that when we do have those moments when we know that our brains cannot fathom what's going on in scripture, cannot fathom what's going on in the world, I think especially during really hard times, difficult times, World War II times, right? Six trumpet war times. Like we're going to have that thing in our brain that goes, what is God doing? Like, why is this happening? And then when we see miracles, we're going to be like, how is that possible? Like Yeshua walks on water. Like, but how does that work? Like there, there's something in our minds where we want to understand how everything happens and works. And I think Yeshua is saying, you're going to know. You may not know right now, but one day you're going to know all of the secrets. And then neither was anything kept secret, but that it should come abroad. So it's going to be exposed. So I, I just see it's kind of a redundant double, kind of a double promise that he's saying, there's nothing that exists that won't come to light to, to consciousness of, of beings. Everything that exists, everything that is to be known will one day be actually seen and recognized and experienced. That, that's what I see the first part. The second part is easy saying there are secrets. There are things that you guys don't know about but they were made secret so that it could be revealed. Like they, they aren't meant to be secret because God just wants to keep his secrets forever. They were kept secret so that there could be a revelation to those secrets, that it could be kind of given on to God for glory. This is just what I get from the scripture, of course. And I think it tied, and like I said, I tie it in with the scripture my brother quoted, knock and you shall find. And I tie it in with the fact that there's promises of knowledge that is kept secret from God himself, telling the prophet, eat this, and don't tell anybody. But then he says, but it is for a generation that's only supposed to know it. So I, I think that that moment where he's telling the prophet about this specific thing and this Mark 422, I think it's the same message. I, I think it's just a confirmation that God basically in short, he has a plan. We're not going to understand it, but one day we will. And that's cliche Christian understanding, but it's so cool to actually see how God says it you know, in the Bible, it's, it's amazing to me. So that's my two cents on it. I hope, I hope I said something to you. Awesome sauce. Oh, Cameron, I guess you're writing comments live. Yeah. I'm not seeing them, but we're not even getting them grayed out. So sorry about that. If you want have Sarah take them and paste them for you on, on the live and, and we'll read. Uh, Ricardo says, same as Abraham and Moses, you didn't need to know about electricity oh. or how I see Cameron's comment. You do? Yeah. I just scrolled back far enough here. Uh, Cameron says, Hallelujah. I was genuinely asking for truth, and God used that quote, Seek and you will find, and he showed it to me. <laughs> it's the most amazing thing in the world. God is real. Yeah, absolutely. That blew my mind and completely shook the foundation I had built my entire worldview on. Thanks for answering my question despite my terrible wording. <laughs> wasn't terrible. I'm glad we, I'm, you know, it was, it was stated like a mystery. And we saw it. And look, I guess we found. <laughs> Amen. Amen. 
So yeah, I'm sorry, finishing Ricardo's comment too. Same as Abraham Moses, you didn't need to know about electricity or how the earth spins around the sun to have a relationship with him. Amen, brothers and sisters. Amen. This is good stuff. Um, okay, Ricardo, is it me? Is it this one me? I think so. Yes. Yeah. Which is you. Okay. 426.29. Okay, it's the seeds. So we already read that. I just want to try to get us through this. Uh, comment is this verse, this parable, if I search correctly here in Mark, is the only time that it mentions in the whole Bible, seems familiar to other parables, and it feels like it is made with pieces of verses of several scriptures in Bible. Same as in verse 26, other parables begin with a man scattering seeds. Verse 27, getting up and not knowing how the seed grew, remind me to Jonah, who the Lord made a vine grow to provide shade for him. Uh, but also reminding me that we are commanded to cast seeds and let go, understanding that God does the growing. We don't. And verse 28 in the order of growing reminds me uh, to go to Ecclesiastes 3, to everything there is a season and about a grain ripe and the sickle and the harvest. Well, that really sounds more than familiar. For me, I read this parable like this. The kingdom of God is like a man who scatters seeds on the ground. Ground is earth. And we are the seeds. God put us on earth to grow as seed grows. This also reminded me to Paul when he said, Thou fool, that which thou soweth is not quickened, except it dies. And that which is soweth, thou soweth, not that body that shall be, but bear a grain. Which reminds me also to baptism, the watery grave, in which we die and born again on his name and his cross and surrender to his will. He sleeps, this is another quote, Ecclesiastes, he sleeps and gets up night and day while he, the seed sprouts and grows, although he doesn't know how. Uh, that's the end of the quote. This feels as same as it says in Ecclesiastes 11.5. As thou knowest not what is the way of the spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child, even so thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. The ground produces grain by itself, first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. As I told before, this feels as the season mentioned in Ecclesiastes 3, the growing process, but also this brings to my mind the whole arc of God's creation from Genesis 1 to Revelations 2, 21, especially for what the parable says in the last sentence. But when the grain is ripe, he immediately starts cutting with his sickle because the harvest time has come. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I see. That was the last comment on 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 these verses, these particular group of verses, and I, I, I also. And should and should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should spring and grow up, and he knoweth not how. And I feel that. Um this process the process that we've all been going through could easily it easily feels this way we know not how despite the fact that there's we could definitely see it happening there's there's you know the lord opens up entire portals in our understanding and in our hearts and it happens over a period of time while while we're here thinking we're reading and we're talking and we're sharing and but that in and of itself is not actually what's giving us the fruits that we get to talk about. No, and we no. still don't know how. That's the beauty of it. We still actually don't know how. And so that's also like a hugely relaxing thing, to be, to, to be honest. Oh, oh, we don't have to figure it all out. We don't have to cause any of it to happen. We don't, we don't have to be responsible for this isn't this isn't like study or chemistry to get an a in the a in the class kind of deal at all this is actually quite different this is totally like as he's describing a plant growing wow what a amazing amen 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 this one is you mary rainey yes okay let me scroll down to that 
Mary Rainey, Mark 4, 37, 38. While the disciples were freaking out about the storm that was being against their boat and even starting to fill it with water, Yeshua was sleeping on a pillow. Uh, then he seemed a little perturbed that they even woke him up to complain about the storm, asking his disciples, why are you even afraid? I have a feeling he went back to bed after telling the storm to calm down and be at peace. What this story illustrates to me is that nothing really is a very big deal to him. No circumstance is a big deal. He can change anything in an instant and he can turn any situation around if he wills it, even if we have a hard time believing it. My friends and I often talk about the temporary nature of this world, that it is kind of like a simulated reality. We're just here to learn, so we don't need to freak out about the storms or even the fear of death. Yeshua resurrected from the, de from the dead, and so will we. And none of what happened here will matter except what we've learned from the experience and take forward with us into, into eternity, of course. How we impact others in their eternal destinations as well. Nothing will happen that he doesn't allow. Although when we ask him to intervene, he often does. When he does, I think he does this to help build our faith. When he doesn't intervene, sometimes it causes us to dig in to seek him further deepening our roots as tree roots seek out water. Wow. These comments are absolutely awesome. Very well said, Mary. Very yeah. well said. Totally agree. Yeah. Totally agree. Sarah Peterson says, Mark 4, 3, 5 to 41, after all the parables that Yeshua spoke to the disciples about the kingdom of God and what it's like, the disciples understood only a little. Yeshua said back in verse 11 that the secret of the kingdom of God was given to the disciples. But even though the disciples hear and begin to understand what Yeshua is saying, the second their faith is tested with the storm on the boat, they are afraid. And then when Yeshua shows his power to protect them, then they are afraid of Yeshua for being powerful in his protection of them. I feel like this is the main issue I have had in my own life. I can hear all about Yeshua and gain lots of knowledge. But the second there is an issue or unexpected event, I get afraid and ask God to help me. But then it's like, I don't actually expect or believe Yeshua to come in with his full power to intervene, even though I really want to believe. It seems to be a disconnect between knowledge of God and the actual power of God himself. His power is what protects us from our own pride. We think that the knowledge we have gained alone will protect us and build, and build us up and prepare us for the hard times ahead. But I think in actuality, we cannot comprehend the true full power of the holiness of Yeshua. Only by his spirit will we be protected and enabled in the hard and scary times. It just makes me want to say, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Sorry, spoiler alert for Mark chapter nine. <laughs> Vicki Richardson replies to Sarah. She says, I have felt this way too, before too. Uh, I often say, I know you can, but will you? Either way, I have to believe that his ways are better than mine. Sometimes I find myself digging deeper and asking what he wants me to learn through, through the storm. He doesn't always take us out of the storms, but gets us to the other side. In the end, I feel my relationship with him is stronger as long as I lean on him. Sarah replies to Vicky. she says, so true. So that's all of our comments for... Uh, Mark five. We're make, we're doing very good on time. Um, four, sorry, four. Yeah, we're doing very good on time. Yeah. Uh, there was a few things I just wanted to comment on before we kind of leave this behind. Um, I I really also so I have certain passages that I highlight on my eSword because you guys, if you're using eSword, you know you can actually highlight passages. And there's, there's some that I highlighted in this one. This is interesting to me. So I'm going to go through them quick. Mark 4, 11, And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto in, them that are without all these things are done in the parables. So we talked about this in the past, but because we're doing the entire Bible read-through, I want to make sure that we read this. He continues to say, this is Yeshua, that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand. 
lest at any time they should be cover, covered, uh, co converted. Convert, excuse me, converted, and their sins shall be forgiven them. Um, I think this is a passage that a lot of believers read, but it, it's like a glaze over. It's kind of it's so maybe it's Elizabethan if you're reading it in the King James version. I think it goes in one ear out the other. I don't think it sticks. Now, this is a really interesting passage that I think is worth noting that Yeshua is actually saying that he speaks in a parable because in a way he doesn't want some people to know the truth and then be saved. And I don't want to say he doesn't want them as if he ha he doesn't have the desire that they should all be saved. He has a desire that everybody should be saved. But I think it's, as he explains, he uses parable because it's a, it's a filter. If he just if he just said it, then they would just do A B C, and then they would be saved. And I think he's clearly telling us in this these two chapters. This is Mark four eleven and twelve. He is clearly telling us that salvation is a response. It's 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 the response of the person who who hears that there is a salvation, who hears there is truth, and then they respond appropriately to it and they seek it out. Um, the other thing is, is I know we get the question a lot, uh, you know, in our life as believers, what, what is an apostle exactly? Like, what's the difference between a disciple, an apostle, a believer? Like, we know there was 12 apostles or 13 or 14 apostles, actually, right? And in this passage, too, I think plays a role in what we're going to read when the when the remaining 11 um, do a draw and pick a Bartholomew to be the 12th apostle apostle in place of Judas, right? And he goes, what, what, what are you guys doing? I didn't tell you to choose him. And they're like, well, it's been so long and we wanted to fill the gap. And he's like, what, like, like I wouldn't fill the gap. And so I think it's super interesting that he doesn't denounce who they did choose, but he does make it clear to them that he always had somebody else in mind, which was Paul. And what is also interesting is that they did choose somebody and there are 12 tribes, and Paul's ministry is on to the Gentile, right? So it, it's super interesting, like, how all this came to be. And I just want to state that if you've ever wondered, like, what is, like, what what, what makes an apostle specifically different? There, there's definitely these uh, things. They've seen Yeshua in flesh. That's a rule. Uh, they perform the miracles. They, you know, have the Holy Spirit. And specifically, God himself chose them for their ministry, right? So. Uh, Bartholomew, I think, is his name. I might be wrong, but Matthew, or you know, was another way, another way of saying it. But Bartholomew uh, was the one they chose, but God recognized him. So there's actually 14 apostles when you include Judas. Uh, so that's a pretty fascinating detail. And this 4, 411 is one of the very distinguishable things. He chose these people to have understanding. He's saying, like, you when people hear these people talk. You can trust they understand. And I think that's really important as we go and we read the rest of the New Testament. It's really important that you you believe Matthew 411. Because if you don't believe 411, then you can't really trust that what you're hearing from the apostles is, is that they understand. Like we would have to ask ourselves, okay, but these are just humans, they're not Yeshua in flesh. Can we trust the conclusions about Yeshua's teachings? And according to this promise 411. Yes, that is the reason he specifically chose them. It was because he bestowed upon them the understanding. So I, I definitely didn't want to skip that. Skip uh, Moving along to the next thing that I, I have highlighted here, um, Mark 4, 22, for there is nothing hid. We covered that. 23, if any man have ears to hear, let him hear. And he said unto them, take heed that ye hear. With what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you and onto you that here shall more be given. So this has kind of two important lessons in it, in, in my humble opinion. Um, one is that you've heard me say throughout my entire ministry that as you read the Bible and as you begin to have a relationship with God, you're going to become more and more convicted. And as you gain conviction, uh, about what you should be doing, what you should not be doing, how you should be walking with the Lord, right? You're going to change based upon your understanding of where you are at that day in that season of your life. And this passage confirms what I what I believe. This is this is one of the passages in which I stand on that concept that we are all in a different place and that our convictions are going to be different. 
So Matthew 4, 24 is the passage. Take heed that what you hear with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you. So the double side of this is also like when you grow in the Lord or when you grow in the word, you're also responsible. There's another passage that we're going to be coming into where he says ignorance is not an excuse. To me, one of the also scary passages in the Bible, because a lot of us think, well, you know, well, I, I don't know. So I kind of I'm, I'm, I'm clear of that. Right. He will have grace on whom he shall have grace. But he does use the sentence that ignorance is not an excuse for when it comes to salvation and so forth. So this is kind of like a. Is that that to me was like when I read these two passages kind of put together. Right. And of course, you know, take your leave of me. I never knew you. I guess those three passages you put those together, they create. To me, a very like, hey, 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 this isn't a game. This isn't fun. This isn't wooey wooey. It's not sitting, you know, doing a special maneuver or listening to special music and feeling good and and just doing what you want. And then you're like, oh, me and God are cool because I'm, you know, uh, you know, I, I'm trying not to make fun of anything right now as I'm saying this, but you know, I'm not. You're not meddling with like crystals or bowls that make certain sounds or music or you know chants, right? Like this is the real deal. And he's saying like he's warning them hey, make sure you do hear. Like, that's really important. Christ is saying, make sure you go get the knowledge. Make sure you go get this information. Make sure you seek out this information, right? So the passage of both that was mentioned tonight by, you know, Alex and other folks tonight, which is knock and the door shall be open to you. Seek and you shall find. But here's the funny thing. When we read those particular passages, maybe not you, but me. When I read that particular passage, I kind of felt like it was like, oh, well, you know, come to me on your own terms, find out what things you're fascinated about me, your Lord and Savior, look into those things, come to me, and, you know, we'll talk, and, and I'll, I'll reveal what you want to know. But here is, is a totally different vibe. He's saying, you better knock, you better seek, because it, what you don't seek for, you're not going to gain. What you don't, what door you don't knock on, it's not going to be open up to you. So you better go find all the doors and you better go knock on them. So it's, and I'm not saying that it's a damnation thing, but he's saying, take heed, like, listen up, you better do this. Right. And so I find that to be a, a passage we definitely don't want to skip over uh, because it does play in other passages coming up. So I want to highlight that one. Um, if, if I may. Yeah. Add to this. Um, I read 424 as well. And I think there's uh, definitely a urgency, um, but I agree with you also in, in what you just said. The urgency does not mean that the that there's a punishment necessarily on the other side of the urgency. For example, he says, take heed what you hear. So pay attention to what you hear. Receive. Look at what you're hearing, especially now he's, I'm assuming he's talking to the apostles here. Um, with what, with what? measuring you measure right with how that shall be measured it shall be measured to you so with what you with what you're looking to to get a calculation on a measurement on an understanding on that shall be measured to you it'll be that'll be given and unto you that here shall more be given and here's the one in 425 I think you're probably about to talk about that, so I'll sh I'll shut up now. I just wanted to say I wanted to walk through that real quick and see that there's something else coming. No, go for it. You're in a flow. Keep going. Well, and then and then he says, "For he that hath to him shall be given, and he that hath not from him shall be taken even that which he hath." So, mm -hmm. it's almost as if that uh, uh, if at some point we we become completely complacent and think we've reached the pinnacle of understanding and we feel that oh all doors have been open we know everything oh we know everything we need to know god's got to be cool with this mm -hmm. um you're actually in danger of having you're actually in danger of losing what you have yes yeah right exactly you yeah know what i mean so it's not it's it's it i wanted to say like it's the perfect presentation it's not meant to sound like I'm going to stab you with a thousand spears. You've made me mad. Right. 
but it's telling you that the way the river flows, if you stop the flow of the river, it's going to flow in other directions and your water is going to recede. It's going to dissipate. It's going to, your, your giant pool that you just had is going to start getting smaller because the water has to keep flowing. You know what I mean? Like that's an analogy that's coming to me right now, but it's a good analogy. Actually. I think like if, if you don't, if you don't keep your river flowing, God's not going to stop his water flowing or running. So he'll dam up your stream and he'll put it onto another place and go somewhere else, which is what water does as well. So I think your analogy is very good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think that's really good. Um, take heed that what you hear with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you. And that also matches with the other, that by which you judge others is that by which you shall be judged. Right. So that's the other thing is like, you, you also have heard me say in my, my ministry, you know, over the years, I say, look, I, I want, I want to feed people way more grace. I want to feed people way more forgiveness. I want to feed people way more mercy because I'm, I am definitely persuaded that I need an infinite supply of those things. I need to be forgiven from a thousand bazillion souls from God himself a thousand bazillion times. I need to have mercy and grace shed and, and, and rain down on me probably literally in a second to second basis for my entire existence. And, and so I try to measure on to other believers through my ministry and through interaction, you know, as much grace as I can in my human weakness, you know, bestow onto others because I, I want to be measured back with it. So this is, this is a great passage too, for us to put that in check. And if you are somebody who is religious, if you are somebody who's legalistic, right? Like this is why you have actually heard me say in my, especially about the holidays, you know, following the Sabbath, especially specifically Passover, I had mentioned, if you're going to tell people that they're doomed or they're in trouble because they're not participating in the holidays, right? You yourself better be sure you are participating in the holidays absolutely 100% correct. And it has to do with this passage. So this is the passage that I am saying like, yo, I don't know if a lot of people who are legalistic, I don't know if they understand the law in which was spoken in, in Mark 4, 24 here. I don't think a lot of people understand that when Christ does speak, it's not just like a guidance book. It's law, it's cosmic law, as I call it, as you guys have heard me call it. So it is, it is just that. And if you go around throwing the book at people, you're going to get that same book thrown at you. And it's an interesting thing to know that nobody on planet Earth can actually do the laws perfectly. You can't. So if you if you're not leading in even the law with grace, like you you've removed the the, the room for error for yourself, you know. I I think that's a super good message. I think it's a good thing. Uh, you know. Yeah. It, uh, it's, my brother brings up just confirms it further, which is for it's super important because yeah, I agree. This is both. This is talking about things we don't normally. These are both con both concepts, which are actually the same concept. What you say is the limit, is the limit that will be applied to you. Yeah. So when you say, I have reached the limit of knowing the Lord that yeah. I'm comfortable with or that I'm happy with, is the limit that you will get. So, and likewise, if you limit another person's experience and you say, hey, these rigid boundaries, like my brother was saying, you know, these you you got to do x y and z to be to make god happy you must do these things when you say it like that you are indeed too that's going to come at you and be like okay you've said this about me in my relationship with my creation have you yourself lived up to the things you say i am or i did or i created or told you to do or told you to do so 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 um it's yeah this is a like take heed is really a good way to start the sentence yeah and Look when the, at examine was, examine yeah and when the Lord, and when yeshua says take heed it's uh, whenever he says i'm telling you the truth or take heed or listen to like that to me is like all right he's this is a thing this is a, this is not just casual conversation for him Right. And it's also not just for believers, uh, I want to say. I, I think it's for all of us, all of us humans on this earth. How many times did you experience in your life um, 
judging somebody based on whatever criteria doesn't have to be biblical and then later yourself experiencing that exact scenario and feeling like wow i was wrong to judge that person yeah uh, um so i mean maybe maybe we all be careful with our with all of that really and if i may give a brotherly suggestion and not that i am perfect in any way shape or form so please don't anybody who's watching this think i'm even trying to remotely say that i am um i i i have learned that the brain at least my brain i'm just talking about my brain my brain let's face it uh not in a boastful way like as in it's screwed up way um my brain does this thing where if i am assessing somebody else it's because i'm trying to make solid my reality in my brain i'm trying to have understanding of what's happening in 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 the existence of all things and and my mind like is one of those minds where it will not have peace until i can have something to understand right and so when I have these big, giant, gaping holes where I'm like, I don't understand how this person could believe ABC. I don't understand how this person could get stuck in this false religion and not see through it. Um, I have found that I personally need something in that slot. So I have found the danger is, is that we come to where we can judge the person and then we start saying, well, they're dumb, they're idiots, they're ignorant, they're prideful, they're this, they're that. And we, and I I have noticed my brain wants to do those things. It wants to start putting those those categories on them so that the brain can go to sleep and go, oh, well, that was, the, that was the problem. That was a missing piece. That's why you don't understand. They're just idiots. Oh, they're, they're just less smart than you or they're just prideful or they're just... They hate God. Like they're just, there's all these things. I, I hope I'm making sense, right? Um, so I have found that I, I put in something specifically in that spot, which is that it's, it's I label it, if you will, like a, a folder in a computer, right? It's, it's empty, but there's a folder. And the folder is that thing I don't understand, but maybe one day I will. And I know you're thinking, well, isn't that the same thing? No, because... If I'm in the state of, of needing to understand, then I'm look, I'm allowing the devil in the, my brain and my flesh to fill my brain with all the possibilities of what it is because the folder needs to be full. But for my brain personally, and I have no idea if there's going to be anybody there, but when I put the folder there in my brain and it says that which you don't know, I feel okay. That's me. I need to put a folder there that just says you don't understand it and that's okay. Like that's the name of the folder. You don't understand it and that's okay. Like I need that to be in my brain as an okay answer, right? And and that allows me to have peace about those things. And and like, I hope that, that I don't know if, if, you, if you can wire your brain like that. I don't know if that works for you, but like that's a thing for me. I have to fill the gap and I have to fill it with that thing I don't know. So that it's a category. I hope it makes sense. I hope I'm making sense right now. Um, so now, you're saying, uh, let me just, if, if I can paraphrase so that it, it can be made more edible, maybe, maybe. You're, you're saying that instead of taking a folder, which is obviously a mystery, right? Mm -hmm. one, one you cannot claim to know because you haven't walked in that folder's universe. You don't know every, you don't know what's contained in that folder. But you're seeing a certain behavior. You're seeing something. You don't, you know, you don't fully understand it. But you're gonna categorize and name the folder. Uh, not just you, all of us are gonna characterize and name the folder so we can more easily ignore it and move on. So, for example, instead of saying uh, this is an unknown that I I'm okay with it being an unknown, we say no, no, okay, I recognize this. This is dumb. So I'm gonna put it in the I'm gonna put it in the dumb trash bin, and that's how we gain peace about it. Right. We've 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 categorized it and judged it and we've gained peace about it so we can move on. So we don't have to go find out really what it is. And you're saying um, that you've you've developed perhaps um, a technique or whatever where you're willing to let that folder be blank and still are able to move on. Yeah, because I guess. I have to give on it. I think if I give an example of when I was a kid, my best friend 
um, in, in high school. Like my family literally like fed him, clothed him. He stayed at my house more than he stayed at his parents' house for, for whatever reason. Maybe they were super poor. I have no idea. But he was over at my house all the time. And we were attached. We looked the same. Every, it was like one of those two kids. Everybody thought we were twins and the whole deal. Anyways, this person did extremely horrific things to me. And the more horrific things he did to me, he, I noticed he climbed higher on the popular list. And I thought to myself, I'm like, what is it to be popular? Like, why would he want to do these things that are harmful and hurtful to me? I don't understand why he's doing it, right? So in this, in this example of my brain would rack because I'm like, did I do something wrong? Does he have something wrong with him? Did, the, did, did somebody pay him? Like, what, what's the deal? And my brain would go through like all these evil, all these things, I'm trying to figure it out. So then I would just go, he ha I would have to create a folder for him in this particular instant. And I would, in my brain, I would have to say, he's lived a life you don't know. He has thoughts you don't know. He has demons he's fighting that you don't know. And if, and if he, for some way, somehow, kind of gets some kind of relief, or he feels some kind of peace, or he feels like, like whatever those things that are tormenting him or whatever it is that he's seeking out in life, if him attacking you or him doing these horrifically mean things to you somehow makes him have more peace in his life, you don't know those elements. You may never know those elements. So just say that's, that's, that's a thing that you don't know. Put that in a folder and put that away. And it, here's what it allows me to do. It allows me to forgive. It, it allows me to, to say, okay, this person is doing things that to me, I like, I want to strangle them. I want to shoot them. I want to beat them with a baseball bat. Like I want to do mean and horrific things back to them so they can feel the pain I feel. But I know that that's not right. So my brain has to do something. So I just go, but there's something that they are dealing with that for whatever reason, if I can't understand why they're doing what they're doing, it means I'm missing that element. And then, and then I go, okay, that's the answer. I'm missing that element. And it, it, it just allows me to put it away. And, but it keeps the folder open because I'm, I'm not saying, I'm not like putting it down and trying to forget my childhood, right? It keeps the memory. It keeps the feelings. It keeps the awareness and the knowledge I learned from it. But there's always a blank that I'm ready to fill at any moment. So I'm glad that you asked what you just said, because it's not that I'm able to just forget about it and just move on. It's that I'm able to find some type of solace or some type of peace about it. Does that, does that you see the difference? So it's still, the folder's still open and it's still blank and I still want to fill it. But I'm just okay with the fact that up until this point in my life, even as my life continues to go, I'm okay with the fact that I don't know what that missing piece is. I, and again, I guess this is some kind of weird little mental thing that I do. Uh, and I don't know, if, again, if this is helping anybody, but it gives me a remarkable amount more peace. And it allows me, I feel, to move on without forgetting it and like trying to just push it down. And, I've, and I noticed specifically like my younger brother and my older brother, one of my brothers, they would do that kind of thing where they push it down or they try to deny that it exists or that there is, there is no folder, there is no experience there that, that they don't understand. And that's the stuff that often their rage is attached to. Their rage is often attached to the things they can't understand or the people that hurt them. And they want that understanding or they want that revenge. And it causes at least my personal family members to, to hold on to this rage. And when you ask them, like, why are you so mad? They can't give you the wording because there's not even a folder. So, so I guess that I have no idea if I'm making any sense, but it, it's just, um, it, it's, it, it's a thing so that it's not just empty and it's not just pushed and away and, and pushed down and it's not just forgotten. You're just okay with it, missing a piece that you just don't understand. You know, and and I, I just feel that when I have those it, and it applies, by the way, to things, not just in your family and friends. I used a personal connection there. But for instance, I think to myself about e evil leaders in the world like Hitler, since I, everybody can raise this concept. I think about how in the heck did that guy wake up and go to sleep at night and think to himself, yeah, this is this is working like this is we're on the right track. This is going to the right track. Right. Like like I do. I have this thing in my brain where I could lay there. And at night, and I will try to think about how in the world does a human person get to that 
a human person, a human being gets to that point in their life where they go, me and my friends were on the right course here with this, you know, put everybody in concentration camps and just kill the whole world. Like my brain will like just go crazy. But then I, then I create this folder in my mind and go, there's stuff that he had going on in his brain, in his emotion, in his history, the way he reacted to the world that I don't know. And I put that in the, I don't know folder and I label it. And, and it, it's, it's, it sounds like it's the same as it's open, but it's not. I guess because I give it a name. And the only way I can describe it is if anybody who plays music, when you when it when there's no note, it's a note. Right? And that's a hard concept unless you play music, but but a note not being played is still a not note, right? So if you play music, you understand. It, it, it's a thing. So Alex, you play guitar, so I guess you understand that too. I so. don't read music, but I know what you're saying. Like if there's a music, you know, there yeah. It's letting you know play nothing in this in this at this moment. But for a period of time, which is weird. Right. Yes. Right. So it says, "Hey, play this for play nothing for a period of time." I've frozen with the weirdest face. This is great. God loves me. Okay. So sorry, that was a rant. I see there's great live comments. Let me just finish this up because I really didn't want to take up the whole thing here. Um, uh, um, and with many such parables spake he. This is Mark four thirty three. And with many such parables spake he to the world unto them, as they were able to hear it. But without a parable spake he not unto them. And when they were alone, he expanded all things onto his disciples. This is another important fact. He only spoke all the time. I can't believe my face is locked on this. <laughs> it's so weird. Dumb. It's so weird. Thank is you, it Lord. your phone? I don't know. Probably my internet. Who knows? So I look both high and muted. It's funny. It's unbelievable. <laughs> okay. So you guys are just hearing my voice. I have no idea what to do about this. I apologize. Um, he only spoke in parables and, and you see when we get to John, especially gospel of John, they actually get frustrated with him, especially at the last night. And they're like, well, you just speak to us clearly. And then right before he goes to get captured, he finally speaks to them clearly. He says, but he's like, well, don't worry, I'm going to speak to you clearly, you know, when I get back. Um, so I think that that's another important thing that we need to really understand is that he expanded upon all these things privately to his disciples so you know if you sit here and you read these things and you're like i don't know if i fully understand well the bible tells us he even gave them more explanation and understanding and they even get frustrated all right final thing that i've highlighted is mark 4 40 to 41 and he said unto them why are ye so fearful how is it that ye have no faith of course this is the calming of the storm and then they feared exceedingly and said one to another, what manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? So I can't believe my face is still frozen. I'm sorry. So um, it's to me, this is super important because as as one of our sisters, I think, had written just moments ago uh, or earlier tonight. Uh, I'm trying to think who it was. I think it was Jennifer Collin. Maybe it was somebody else. Uh, maybe Sarah. Um, but it was they were talking about how. Um, they get into a place where you're like, you know, the word and then, but your faith or your walk is not a hundred percent, right? Like it's not super connected and the knowledge kind of isn't almost enough or the, or you can have an understanding where you have a, a moment of clarity in a scripture, but then life happens. It beats you down. And it's like, you forget all the revelations, all the clarity, all those aha moments. Right. And so I just want to say like, you don't get to beat yourself up. Because this happened with them that they even asked, what kind of man is this? It's my understanding at this point, they already understand that he's Messiah. But, but here they are saying, how is he able to tell the ocean or the sea to be chill and it chills out? So if you're somebody who, who you're like, oh, I'm walking good with God, everything is rocking and rolling, and then you come into a season and you're like, I don't, I'm scared. Like, I don't know if I trust you. I don't know what you're going to do. I can't wrap my brain around this. You know, uh, you know, are you, are you God in the way I think you're God or are you God in a different type of way? Mark four lets us know the apostles who walked with them had the same struggle. So I, I, and I do think that's important. I think that some people, 
at, or I think everybody at some point in your life is going to have that kind of struggle where you're like, I know I say, I, I know I love Christ. I know who he is. And then there's times where I'm like, where are you? What are you doing? You know? And that's like fitting because they're doing the same thing when he's telling the storm to chill out. And it's almost like as if they don't have a clue who he is, but they obviously do. So yeah. Hope that makes sense. Anyways. All right. Five. I think there's, I think, there, I think we can get through it. Yeah. Um, Alex? yeah, I think we can make it through. I just, I would love for you to be able to unfreeze your face. Cause you want me to try to call back? I'm worried that I won't be able to get back on. Will you be able to get me back on? Uh, I think so. Okay. Let's do it because as glorious as this frozen face is, I think it might benefit the video for, for you to be normal. Okay. Let's do it. Let's try. Here we go. All right. All right, there goes there goes Nathan, and he's back. Look at oh. that! His face is no longer cray cray. Wow, that was super easy. I just had that to... was something else. Um, all right. Easy peasy. Mark five. Again, why is it happening to me? You see, this is the thing. All right, <laughs> if you wouldn't mind, good sir. Huh? You, you read since I just read yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to go ahead. Um, Ogachuku, Mark 5, verse 7. And cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Yeshua, son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. Demons once again confessing he is the son of him, confessing him as the son of God. Remember when Satan questioned Yeshua being the son of God in the wilderness? I find this comparison very interesting. Yeah, they are they are not confused at who's standing there looking at them. Well, I don't want to say that. They may be, there's probably some mystery. It sounds like there might be some mystery. They may not quite understand who's standing there, but they do understand that he is the offspring of God in yeah. flesh. That yeah. part they understand. But what that means, like what the fullness of that means, you mean? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, I don't think they do. Um, I think, um, but they certainly know he's God, God's authority. Um, um, should, should I continue reading? Jennifer sure. Connolly? Okay, Jennifer Connolly, Mark 5. Yep. Uh, when Yeshua asked him, what is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Yeshua again and again not to send him out, to, out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on nearby hillside. The demons begged, Yeshua, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission, and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. Could this have been a political message? Uh, Legion was the largest unit in the Roman army. At that time, a legion averaged about 5,000 fighting men, though it could have thousands more or fewer. The boar image, which was on the Roman emblem at the time, was likely strengthened by the fact that the length, um, uh, I'm sorry, that the 10th legion of the Roman army, Legio Ten Fratensis of the Straits, Pretenses means up the straits, um, which took active part in the destruction of the Jerusalem temple in 70 AD, um, was known as the boar because of its prominent emblem. Yeshua goes into the Gentile part of town, healing the isolated man, which was not really allowed due to the Gentiles' unclean status. But was he sending a political message about Rome back to the Jews when he used the pigs? Hmm, interesting question. Um... Uh, Psalms 89, 80, verse 9, You brought a vine out of Egypt, you drove out the nations and planted it. Why then have you broken down its walls, so that all who pass along the way pluck its fruit? The boar from the forest ravages it, and all that move in the field feed on it. Who is the wild boar who ravages the Jewish vine? Esau, from the rabbi's from the rabbi, whom the rabbis associate with Rome. Mm. Right? Actually, Christianity is thought of as Esau as well. Mm. 
and uh because it did start you know the it didn't start in rome but the you could say sort of the um organized christianity um definitely had a huge start in rome as a religion um right yeah jennifer these are deep interesting correlations between the the boars the pig the yeah. legion that's very very interesting mm -hmm. the connection to rome yeah and very also cool. what what do they what do the apostles later when they go into the gentile home what is it that they're always scared they're eating which they're not allowed to eat which is pork pork yeah so this is there's a i think there's a thing here i think you're onto a thing here jennifer i think you're onto it it's good stuff um I kind of wonder, I, I remember at the beginning when we started the EBRT, somewhere around Leviticus or somewhere around there in the beginning, um, I used to think about this, uh, this occurrence with the pigs and wonder if perhaps the pigs are particularly, uh, particularly susceptible to being possessed. And if so, maybe that's what makes them less clean and mm. less and 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 unkosher for the for the Jews to deal with because if they were to slaughter pigs as food they would be potentially releasing spirits into whoever is around perhaps who's not well defended something like that i don't know i remember thinking that i don't know if that we had really that talk we did have that talk yeah yeah we did yeah Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm seeing so many great live comments. I so good. I know we're running on time here. You guys have great live comments. Um, mm, good stuff. Um, not trying to ignore you. Well, we could read some. It's all right. If you uh, want. Uh, going back a little bit. Um, Mary Rainey says, yeah, there was a thing that happened to me in my life that had me thinking like a hamster in a hamster wheel trying to figure out a paradox. Uh, I wasted so much energy on it. I finally had to make myself stop thinking about it and trying to figure it out in order to have some peace. Exactly. Eventually, after I stopped trying to think about it later on, I started to again understand. Bam. And I think that's the thing is as we experience life, we'll, we end up having that understanding, right? Yep. Um, um, let's see. Um, uh, she also says, this is something that can happen when you study the word. It can be confusing because of your lack of understanding. It's important to just accept that you don't and can't know or understand anything. Yeah. And you know what I did? And I talked about how I did that with the scriptures as well. And I remember Alex, when he was reading through the, and I uh, basically everybody who reads the Bible for the first time, they get into the rabbit holes and the, the Nephilim and the, you know, that whole era of the Bible. And I'm like, man, I know it's hard. You just got to let it go. Just keep reading. Like, you're going to realize like none of that really matters that much right even though it's like where we all we all me included i got so enamored and i gave like years of my life to it that i ended up thank god i got past it where i realized it doesn't really matter so so yeah that it's having that thing in your head where you can just say i'm gonna i'm gonna either allow life to end up filling this in or god to fill this in one day or what or whatnot uh susan i have noticed that when i studied the word and I don't understand, I pray about it. And at some point in the future, I just get this knowing like a light bulb went on. And in a way it did. The Holy Spirit gives me discernment and it seems to happen when, I, when I'm when i not trying so hard to understand. Amen. Exactly, exactly. Um, Bob says, as we work through it in faith, we gain the understanding on the other side of the experience. Um, if we can continue to logically conclude to come to logical conclusions, we find the missing details and eventually it makes sense. Amen. Um, okay, cool. Good stuff. Okay. Yeah. Um, Chuku, Mark 513. Sorry, you wanted to say something? About no, no. Oh, Mark uh, 513. Ogachuka says there was approximately 2,000 pigs, and so because the spirit's name was Legion, for there were many, even though 
they were all inside one man, then they likely entered the pigs individually. Therefore, maybe it was to show how many unclean spirits there were altogether. She continues on. I'll just keep reading. She says, Howbeit Yeshua suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord has done for thee and ha hath had compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in uh, Decapolis um, how great things Yeshua had done for him. And all men did marvel. Mark 5.19 through 5.20, first time Yeshua allowed a healed man to go and tell everyone from what I can recall. Here, I think it might be the first time, at least that we know in the storyline. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, any Anybody... I know nobody commented. It doesn't look like anybody commented on that specifically. And I don't have much of a coherent thought or answer. I just have the question. Why did the pigs rush to the water and were drowned? Like, what, what was the thing there? I don't know. It's a mystery to me. Um, do you have any ideas about that, Nathan? I do. Is it too early to talk about it? Well, yeah, I think I think we could quickly go over. But so you remember the scapegoat, right? Yeah. The scapegoat, one was killed and one was released into the forest. And the yeah. sin was the one that was le released into the forest. Right. And I find it interesting that they say, you know, don't torture us. Now, here's something interesting. Right. I say they say. But when I read it again, I wonder, is it the man who says, don't torture me? knowing that he has done evil things and sin when he sees yeshua is it the man that says don't torture me or is it the demons that say don't torture me because i almost feel like it's the man saying don't don't blame me for what has been going on in me like i don't have that control and then the demons come up and then they they kind of talk I, but this is a thing so then when the demons do say come out uh, or when they say uh for yeah. we are what go ahead it's uh, 512 and all the devils besought him saying send us not into this send us i'm sorry send us into the swine that we may enter into them yeah so but here's the thing so five six but when he saw yeshua afar off he ran and worshiped him and right. cried with a loud voice and said what have i to do with thee yeshua son of the most high god i adjure thee by god that thou torment me not so it says that he did that right this is what i'm talking about i see so like, like did the word of yeshua get which would make sense that it did because it tells us that he was everywhere already right so did the word of yeshua get to this guy and his fear is that this powerful very holy man would hear about the evils that this guy is doing and so he acknowledged like he gives him praise and acknowledgement right like He's like, hey, 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 I know you think I'm just this evil dude who probably hates you because you're holy and righteous. I don't. I know who you are. I believe who you are. Uh, don't don't, don't curse me or abuse me or torment me for all the things I've done. And and so when I read it, I was like, wow, I, I originally always read that as those are the demons talking. Right? But I'm like, but now when I read it, it says, and he ran to them and he said these things. And then when they talk, they talk different. Uh, and it does say, and he answered saying, my name is Legion. But I just don't know if the he here is the human or the demon, right? I, I'm just saying I don't know these things. But So to answer your question um, into why they would run in the pigs is that I believe that the, based upon the scapegoat description of the Old Testament, that demons can jump. They can jump from one living thing into the next living thing, right? And I found it super interesting that this man, you know, who has all these demons in him, like he has super strength and he's kind of outcast and cast out. And there seems to be like, there seems to be something going on with him that like, we don't know what the history is. Like, well, how did this happen to him? Why did him? We also notice it is in a Gentile location. And then the fact that there's 2000 swine as Jennifer had mentioned, that all run into the ocean. And it does say that they they were choked in the sea. So they drowned. Well, if they did, then they could jump into fish, right? 
So maybe there wasn't any other really livestock or literally other animals that they could have all jumped into. But you got to think how many living creations are in the ocean. A lot, especially back then, right? We haven't like commercially schooled them out. So that's my two cents of, and I tie that in again with the scapegoat concept of the devils jumping. Like they can jump from one to another, right? So that that's that's why when they say like allow us to go into the pigs and then they were cast into the ocean, like or they run into the ocean, it's like it. Which is I do I did want to talk about this and nobody else had talked about. It, so it's interesting to me that he gets in the boat, goes across. There's a storm. I know there's a whole lot we don't have to go elaborate on this just yet, but I, I'm just going to encourage everybody to kind of think about this. He gets in the boat. He's sleeping. The guys who are with him are freaking out. He wakes up annoyed with their freaking out. He uses a power they have not yet even seen. They go all the way across to this place with the Gentiles, not Jews. The only thing they do and experience is this one guy. He casts him out, gives the guy an amazing testimony, and then the swine die, which is their food. right? And, and if you know history, the swine actually basically kept people alive back in those days. So that's another thing that kind of shows the blessing of God is that if you didn't get sustained by swine, then you basically had to have God on your side. So that there's a kind of a testimony there as well. And and like he they, he kills the entire crop of swine. 2,000 swine is a lot, right? Like if that was destroyed and all the people come out and they tell Yeshua to leave, they get mad at him. So I was like, okay, there's something to the fact of that as well, that Yeshua is being told like, you just got here. You, you clean this man, yeah, but, like, you just killed all of our pigs. And they knew, like, I think they knew that if he continued in their world, he would do exactly what we talk about before the holiness challenge, which is that when you seek the Lord and you allow that refinement to happen, when you allow him to come into your life, he will rip apart everything. He will just totally destroy everything in your life that has been an idol or a demon in your life, or anything that is like been kind of like a thing that that is not good for you, or God doesn't want for you. And the crazy thing is, is like he just goes in and he just immediately does it. And and like I, I hope I'm making sense. I'm trying to be super quick with this. Um, I know it's probably a bit of a rabbit hole. Yeah. Um, it, it, but it, I think there's a ton of meaning to it. Maybe we'll get to it in the other gospels or, or another time. But um. Yeah. I, I think I think I, I was just going to say that I kind of agree with your original assessment of who's talking. I see how you could see that maybe maybe the man is having a moment of clarity and knowing who Yeshua is. But what gives me the clue that it wasn't necessarily the man is and cried with a loud voice. I believe that's kind of a I believe that's making us know that it's not a normal voice that it was probably one of those manifestation voices, so a demon manifesting voice, which probably this guy sort of had going on all the time whenever he did speak, because mm. there's a legion in him. And um, so I, I could see it both ways, but I think, you know, uh, as soon as he talked, I think, you know, you know, Yeshua doesn't need him to talk to know, but everybody else knew that there's something going on with this guy. Yeah. And as he continues to say, my, as he, as it says, and he, and like, just like you said, and he answered saying, my name is Legion. It, it almost lets us know that though his mouth was answering, it wasn't him talking. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that. I mean, yeah. I, I again, I'm not trying to highlight that. Maybe it's a good point. I mean, he, he cries out. I, the fact that he was tormenting and cutting himself with stones in a tomb and he was, you know, excommunicated basically from society. He was a freak. They tried to chain him up. You know what I mean? Like, if yeah. I spoke, I think I would cry out with the loudest voice I possibly could, too. As in, like, hey, don't run away from me. I know you're the one who can also remove this from me. Right. I think that there might yeah. be a conversation here that, that, like, happened in between that maybe they just didn't leave in. Uh, and again, this is me just, this is just conversation, guys. Was, I, I, there's no way for any of us to know. I, and my brother is right. If, if anything, it makes more sense that I guess it was. It, it, the thing that makes me confused I mean, do the demons really worship him or do they just acknowledge him? Like, what does the word worship mean? We'd have to break that down. But like, if I was somebody who was demonically possessed and then I saw the Lord, I saw the Lord with the power to save me and get rid of this horrific type of possession that this guy must have been experiencing, right? 
I would scream at the absolute tell my lung, my throat yes. probably red to get that guy to come over to me. Right? Yes, true. That's true. And and that's one of the hallmarks of a exorcism, I believe, from what I've read or seen, whatever, um, is that the victim has to want to be rid of the demons. Because yeah. they're right. I've heard things like there's such a thing as what what do they call it? Perfect perfect possession where the victim is happily yeah. He's just happily on board. Right. Yeah. They can't confess that they want it out or anything. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So, so this, yeah. that's, that, that's, that's my persuasion. But, you know, again, like, it's not something we need to argue about. Or, you know, I'm on, but just you know, go too much into it. You know, either way, the Lord can do what he wants. He can cast out whatever he wants for whatever. Um, just real quick, the passage, Matthew 5, 19, because nobody else talked about it on our notes. How be it Yeshua suffered him not, but saith unto him, go home. So here's something super interesting. This guy wanted to follow Yeshua, right? And there's people that Yeshua said, come and follow me, and they didn't. And yet here's this guy who's a Gentile. He's the first Gentile that says, I want to follow you, right? And Yeshua says, I, he suffered him. He suffered him not. I don't know if, if the suffering thing is, is just poetry, but it does say, send forth various application, cry, forgive, forsake, lay aside, leave. It, it's kind of a weird word because G575, it's just a weird word to me that like... I feel like it, it means, I feel like it means many, many times it means tolerate, you know, like... Yeah, like... Deal he, with. Deal with. That's how I perceive it, is like he didn't yeah. want to deal with him. And yeah. I'm like, how, how cold of a thing is that? That there is, there is a guy who, I mean, if anybody has a testimony, if anybody understands the danger of what our souls are going to go into... It's a guy who has 2,000 plus demons living in him. And he says, Lord, I want to follow you. I mean, that's what Christ is looking for from everybody. Come and follow me. And Christ turns him away. Right. And, and I wanted to highlight this because it's, it just seems so backwards from everything that Christ commands us, actually, especially in the Gospel of John. He commands us. It's so backwards that he would, this guy wants to, and he says no. And the only reason I'm saying this is like because. I I am of, of the persuasion that there are going to be believers in this world who are going to have a life where they feel as though they could be in the presence of Christ. They could be amongst the apostles. They could be basically in the comforts and the protection of the church. And Christ is like, no, not. You're going to be one who's going to go out alone. Paul, I guess Paul style, right? You're going to be one who goes out, well, Paul had somebody, but you're going to go out alone and no, you don't get to hang out with me. You don't get to be filled with all my joys and all my peace and the coolness and you're not going to eat my bread every day and you're not going to be walking with me. No, that's not your path, right? And he tells this guy, I'm not going to be suffering. You know, I'm not going to be dealing with you as, a, as somebody hanging out with me the rest of my life. So you just go and you, you give your testimony. And I think to myself, like, there's there's like i have two feelings here i don't know if anybody else had these feelings but i have two feelings here i'm like wow that in a way yeshua punked this guy like this guy literally like was coming to him like yo i just experienced this i want to be with you you're the guy you're the guy guys right and he's like no go and do your thing and the thing is is like this ties in with who is the pot to say to the maker i made you wrong like who are you to say that what christ calls you to do or how christ calls you to live is, is a mistake or is wrong, even if it like what I'm trying to say, and I hope this makes sense. We can look at the commandments of Christ and we can say, well, I want to do all those things. I want to do all those things. Give me God all the things I need. Put me in the environment which I need to accomplish those. And he says, no, you're going to be in an environment which is hostile. You're going to be in an environment which won't receive you. You're going to be in an environment which, you know, is not going to go well for you. I mean, it does say that they marveled about the guy, but he's He's in a Gentile world is my point. And, and, but he testifies and he has that testimony the rest of his life. And I'm of the persuasion. It's just a faith thing. Uh, it's not a scriptural thing that people like this, who Christ did heal. And they went and they told all their friends are the people who basically laid the foundation for Paul to come in later and, and be the one who kind of like he, he, he finished the work that their testimony started, right? And not all of us are called to, to, to be in that really comfy place 
where we get to be apostles with Christ. And it wasn't comfy for them after Christ went away. But he does say when the, when the groom is with them, right, it's like it's time to rejoice because one day the groom's going to go away and then they're going to get the, their booties handed to them. I, 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 again, I hope I'm making sense. I am trying to be short of here, but it's a very, I don't know if it stuck out to anybody else, but I was like, wow, Christ just told this guy, no, I, you don't, what I command everybody else to do or ask everybody else to do, you want to do, and the answer is no. And it's like, why? Well, it, it's because he was setting a foundation with his testimony. And, and the other thing is, is I think it's interesting that Christ went and this was the only event to happen, which tells me that this was totally part of Christ's plan. So I don't know if you're somebody, whether you're reading while you're watching this video recorded and you read this by yourself, like without the live fellowship, if you're reading this and you're like, wow, that was kind of mean of Christ, it might, it might be mean, but at the same time, it was needed. And Christ may call us to do things that might look mean, like he's abandoning us or he's telling us, no, you don't get that. And we might be like, well, that's mean of you. Or, or, and, and he even says, woe to those who are offended because of me, right? Or onto me, but it's like because of him. Well, this is a guy who could be offended onto Christ. He could be like, well, now I'm stuck in this world. I could be with him. I could have been one of those Paul. I could have walked with him. I could have been following him around, but he actually told me no. And he could be mad, but instead he goes and he does what Christ tells him to do. And he sets a foundation that he has no idea what will be a blessing of it in later years. I, I feel like this is, um, right now it's kind of coming clear as a um, analogy or a preview of the Gentiles receiving. Yeah. So for the thousands of years, a couple thousand years, since this time to us, we have seen the world of the nations receive Christianity. And uh, <laughs> we've also seen how difficult it is for them to go full kosher. So what happens when Yeshua goes and meets this dude? He completely heals him. He performs a, 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 a tremendous miracle is performed. This guy is super strong and can crush anyone, which kind of makes you think of Rome, as as Jennifer Connolly points out, of, of the strength of the, the nations and the, their empires. So here's, here's this guy. Suddenly he's cured, healed. He wants to follow Yeshua, but Yeshua says no. And if you think about it, and then and then he performs it. What 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 would the rest of his people? What did the how did the rest of his people uh, uh, react? Even though there was this crazy miracle, they were upset that their pigs are gone. So so if you think about the church that sprung up, let's say in Rome and in other places in the Gentile world, uh, it wasn't a church that said, "Let me take on all of the everything it is to be a uh, uh, um, a you know j let's say." Jewish, Jewish, yeah. and then a Messiah follower, like no, we're we're gonna we're gonna follow. We're gonna basically make. We're, we're there, there's a lot of things that that world did, and I'm not judging them because obviously sh there's a place for them. There's mm -hmm. a lot of things that that world did that had to combine those keeping those pigs around, and having Yeshua. Yeah, and so. It was this, it's why the Jews can't touch it, right? It was this thing that became this thing that we talk about all the time. The the, the weird holidays that aren't real. The the, the strange ways in which uh, the church, various different denominations are structured that, that seem to borrow from the Old Testament, but they only seem to borrow things that they like. And so, you know what I'm saying? So this guy's, this, this moment is like a preview of that. Like if you really want to be with me, or if you want me to stay here, then your pigs are gone and we're going to have a full on transformation. You guys have to catch up to the people I'm taught. I am suffering, which is the Jews. And wait, and, and real quick, what did he leave him with? A testimony. Yeah. Right. Yeah. He left, he left him with a testimony. So yeah, it, I'm biting my tongue, but it's all good. It's good. These are good things. Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, you want to read this one, Sharon Lewis, or do you want me? Sure. Uh, I, I can do it. Uh, Sharon Lewis Roberts, Mark 5, 25 through 34. This miracle is a special place in my heart. After first receiving Yeshua and reading the New Testament, I came across this miracle that touched me. I could not think about it without getting teared up, which 
happen while traveling on a train home from work. Now reading it again, verse 34 is, seems new to me. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. It almost feels like he's talking directly to me. Thinking about the lady when she felt ostracized for so long and no one cared, it must have been a beautiful moment for her, the words and the healing. Yes, it is quite beautiful. And, and it is important to know, too, that, you know, the Jews, if you were if you remained cursed or sick, they believe that it was because like how they treated Job. Well, you must have done something wrong. Repent or get mad at God or you got to do something like God doesn't just let you stay sick if unless you deserve it. Right. So yeah. there's this kind of deserving thing. So then the fact that Yeshua just comes and says your faith has made you be healed. Like, yeah, that's a. Bam, that's like she can carry that the rest of her life is like, yeah. you know, that's a, that's a badge of honor for her to have for the rest of her life that nobody can take away. You yeah. know, Christ recognized her faith. That was amazing. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, think of, well, well good, good point. Pump the brakes. Think about that for a moment. <laughs> Christ acknowledges your faith. Yeah. You're healed. What? Yeah. Love yeah. thy God with all your heart and all your soul. And Christ said, you've done that. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. That, yeah. It's a pretty good word, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, he, and he's like daughter. He calls her daughter. You know, yeah. it's being like the her. It's so sad that like she has to touch him and then like hides because she's probably worried that you know the high priest or the high ranking people or the apostles because she may not know their personalities that they'll act like the high priest, which is how dare you? You don't touch the holy ones. You're dirty. That's the other thing, right? Like it's a big deal if 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 Yeshua was acting like the normal priest of the temple she could not have touched them. Like it would be a thing where they'd have to burn their clothes. They would have to go and do the whole bath and the ash. Like they would have to do all sorts of stuff because she has a blood issue, right? They're not, she's not supposed to even so much as touch them. That's why they also, when they're walking on the streets, they're like, oh, don't touch me, right? And it, it, it seems like they're like, oh, well, holier than now. Well, they were commanded to remain, you know, don't, don't be touched, don't interact with because they have to go to the temple clean. The irony was, is that they were already not clean <laughs> and they weren't acknowledging what the sin that made them dirty. So, but they won't want to get touched by a sinful person, right? Exactly. If you get my point. Yeah. So the thing was yeah. just hypo hypo hypocrisy, right? This is bad. Right. So uh, are we on Gilda? Uh, I think we're on Ricardo. Oh, we are? Oh, no, we might be on Gilda. Sorry about that. Yes, we're on Gilda. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Gildas chapter 5, I can more than relate to Mark 5, 26, having suffered much at the hand of physicians. I love that she went for it and touched the hem of Yeshua's garment. She didn't even aim to touch his skin, but she believed that just his clothes was sufficient for miraculous power. You can really tell that she truly believed if she just made contact with something that was a part of him, she would be healed, and she was. I will forever love this story because it is so relatable and so extremely heartfelt to me. My dad told me this story years ago when he was very sick, also with a different issue of blood. He was always trying to somehow touch Yeshua's garment too. I imagine he gets to be with Yeshua in person now, healthy and well forever. Hallelujah, sister. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Ricardo, Mark 5, 25 to 34, the woman with the blood issue. Um... Uh, we know the scripture, so I'll just skip to the point. Um, okay, let's make pause here. Twelve years suffered of many things by the hand of physicians, out of money because of that. And rather than getting better, she was getting worse. But when she heard of Yeshua, she made the move and came from behind and touched him. This situation's mind-blowing in several aspects. The faith this woman had drove her to do something she ain't supposed to. Check this, Leviticus 15, 19-25. And if a woman have an issue, and her issue in her flesh be blood, she shall be put apart seven days, and whosoever toucheth her shall be unclean until the evening. And everything that she lieth upon in her separation shall be unclean. Everything also that she sitteth upon shall be unclean. And whosoever toucheth her bed shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until evening. And whosoever touches anything that she sat upon shall wash his clothes um, and bathe himself in water and be unclean until evening. And if it be on her bed or on anything whereon she sitteth, 
when he toucheth it, he shall be unclean until the evening. And if any man lie with her at all, and her flowers be upon him, he shall be unclean seven days, and all the bed whereupon whereon he lieth shall be unclean. And if a woman have an issue of her blood many days out of the time of her separation, or if it run beyond the time of her separation, all the days of the issue of her uncleanness shall be as the days of her separation. She shall be unclean. So it means that she should be unclean as long as she has the blood issue period. So even if it's an abnormal, you know, abnormal cycle. Uh, if Yeshua were just a regular man, he would be made unclean in this act, according to Leviticus here, at least Yeshua's garments. And knowing she came from behind, this felt as a very daring move. Let's get back to the pause story. And Yeshua, immediately knowing in himself the virtue had gone out of him, turned about uh, in the... Pr turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, uh, Thou seest the multitude thronging th thee, and sayest thou who touched me? And he looked around about to see her that he, th to see her that had done this thing. Sorry, sorry, pause again. This is a very funny situation. I just imagine the dialogue and the dynamic of the situation. Hilarious. The disciples did not know that Yeshua felt that someone was healed or just for just touching his clothes. They just heard Yeshua saying, who touched my clothes? Oh, and I read true. as the disciples saying in simple words, uh, are you kidding? Are you kidding me right now? Look around. How can you ask who touched you? Like everybody's touching you, right? I'm, I'm adding that because I'm, I'm with you on that. I imagine they, uh, they bouncing uh, and being mobbed a full crowd and mayhem, but Yeshua kept looking around. This felt as totally 100% control folly. Come on, he knows. Several situations told before make pretty clear to understand that Yeshua knew who and what just happened. Yeshua, for me, is here acting like a father playing hide-and-seek with his child and making like he doesn't know where the kid is hiding. Yeshua wanted this woman to come to him by her own, not because of an order or command. The moment this woman touches Yeshua and felt she got healed, I believe is when she felt who Yeshua was indeed. And she just made at least his clothes unclean, like, oh my God, what did I do? Okay, continuing the story. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. I read as she told him everything and said unto her, Daughter, thy faith has made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. End of controlled folly. Amazing. Um so amazing it's so awesome it makes me think of what we just talked about earlier today which is seek and you shall find you know you're describing getting the sense that he knew he was going to go here and there's this woman here and there's going to be this great story for the ages in in the greatest book of testimony ever right he knew all of this was going to go down but he wasn't going to seek her out and say i have come i know what you want no he's just going to walk and he's going to really make her work at it work at it and take all the steps so that it could be this great moment for her mm -hmm. and 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 also show us that yes we can't while he absolutely knows every little thing that's going on with you while god really truly knows um it doesn't mean that you know like a like a butler, he's going to show up at your door and say, what do you need, master? Right. <laughs> That's a good analogy. Yeah. And, and, you know, Jennifer also says upon her confession, the other thing that's interesting is she was healed, unknown, un, unspoken, right? But then he, he got her to confess that what she had done was technically against Levitical law. Right. And it matches with when the, the prostitute is brought before him and they're all ready to stone her. And he says, he who is without sin, let him throw the first stone. And he goes, well, where's your accusers? And she goes, there's nobody here. And he goes, well, then I don't accuse you either. And it, it's a it's a it's a similar thing in the sense here that he, he could have accused her of breaking a Levitical law. He could have been all uppity and been like, you know, oh, don't you know the Levitical law and blah, 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 blah. But he he didn't. And I don't want to steal the thunder from anybody. Is there anybody else that goes over this? I don't want to steal any type of comment. There, there's other people who are commenting on it, but I, I think I know where, well, maybe I think I know where you're going to go, but 
Um, I'll just say it so I don't forget. We can move smoothly. Yeah. It's that he. Uh, okay, I lost my train of thought. He uh, should put on his thing. I I lost my train of thought. That stinks. I'll well, get to I was, it. I was thinking that you might go into the fact of what specifically her faith was. It wasn't just so much. So she, if if what we're getting to here is exactly right, that she actually knew that what she was doing by what she was doing was breaking of law and like she felt ashamed and like, oh boy, I'm going to get in trouble. Right. But she went anyway. It means that she had the faith that he truly is the savior yeah. because he's not just going to save her from her issue. He's going to save her also from the law. Right. So... That wasn't what I was going to say, but that is a very good point. But but what I was going to say is along the lines of, I don't know if we can wrap our minds around this, and and I know the state sentence is true, and but there's a the theological massive like month long conversation that we could have from what I'm about to say, right? According to Levitical law, what she did was was technically his clothes were dirty, but the thing is, is that because those clothes were touching him, she couldn't make them dirty, right? Like you can't dirty Christ. He right. cleans you. Right. Right. So this is, this is the thing about when, when we have a human high priest, we can dirty the human, like a normal human high priest, which is matches also with the promise of the garden which is that it's this particular individual whose heel will bruise the serpent's head, who will make all things new, right? It's because there's nothing about Yeshua that can be tainted. There's nothing about, he, he must be untaintable. He must be unblemishable, right? Like you couldn't put a blemish on him if you tried. And of course I'm speaking, you know, spiritually speaking, right? So it, that, that and, and this is a given that we as believers understand but when you have read the totality of the Bible, and you do understand, as our brother had quoted and I had mentioned, about this Levitical law that she clearly broke, and, and if she had been doing it for 12 years, she knew what the consequence was for the man that she was going to be touching with this. She knew what the consequence was. But she, as, as our people are saying live right now, but she had to do something. Like, this is her one chance to get rid of this. And as you say, this th there's the conclusion we can come to that this is a testimony of who she knew Yeshua was. She knew that if she could just touch his hem, she would not only just be healed, but she also, I guess we could conclude that she had the faith that he would not be dirtied. Right? Like, that's so much more to this story that if you don't know the old school t t uh, Levitical law, that doesn't even resonate. That doesn't even go into the head. It's just that like he's a superhero who has super powers of healing. And if you just so much as like sneeze on his outfit, oh, you're healed. Like right. that's how it can be and, read and, when you read it, right? And your fear of having touched this cloak is only like a normal fear of doing something without someone's permission. Is if he was a celebrity and yeah. yeah and like, I'm so sorry. Can I please touch a cloak? No. <laughs> exactly. But when she, if she's been doing it for 12 years, she knows exactly the result he's going to have to go through in normal, in normal stakes, right? And the fact that he doesn't have to, and I did notice too, and I don't know if this stuck out to anybody. I really don't want to take it from anybody. But the fact that they use the word in the virtue. Yes. Him, yes. I'm sure somebody got it, so I won't say anything more. But I thought, okay, well, here's a passage where it doesn't say the power just left him. It says the virtue left him. And then he's quick to turn around and go, hey. Right. Like, hey, somebody touched me. Who who was it? And and so then he knew a thing happened. But and just as he is Lord over the Sabbath. Right. Just as he's Lord over the Sabbath, he's Lord over. The Levitical laws and 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 if anybody ever comes across somebody who's legalistic and says, oh, we have to obey all the Levitical laws and this and this and this and that it's. Christ is not submitted to the Levitical laws. If he was, he would have had to immediately go and cleanse himself. He would have had to been seven days. He would have had to do all these things, right? He who writes the laws, it's not that he doesn't have to obey. He doesn't have to obey it by him. But the thing is, is he writes the laws because the laws are to help guide man, right? Not man fulfills the power of the law, right? And, yeah. and this Sabbath isn't the only one, is I guess what I'm really trying to say. Sabbath isn't the only one. Okay, it's all of them. Yeah. He can't rewrite the book 
because he is the book. If he you think, right? It's like, it's amazing. The I'm best. Just, sorry, I, I tried to talk already <laughs> twice. I'm so excited. We have more to read, so go go ahead. Yeah, bro. real quick, I was just gonna say the the what like a good way I could come up with or whatever is occurring to me about how to talk about Christ. He is the holy of holies and the high priest combined together. And the and and the Ruach Hakodesh, which fills and holy of holies. He, yeah. yeah. Well, the Holy Holies is the room. Right. Right. So he's the ark. He's the testimony. Right. He's the Holy of Holies. Yes. He's he's the smoke, the gold smoke of the Royal Cockadesh, and he's the high priest. Right. Yeah. So it's that like, means if it so that means if if you could separate him into all of those things and the temple is back and she comes to the high priest with her issue and she does all the things that Levitical law require her to do, she could be healed. And the mm -hmm. high priest would not be blemished. But that would take like, you know, yes. an X amount of time and, and 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 actions and all kinds of things. Whereas in Christ, it all happens like this because he's all of them together. Exactly. And Ricardo does say virtue in Greek is force, literally or figuratively, specifically miraculous power, usually the implication of mirac miracle itself. Yeah, it's. I'm not trying to say that the word virtue meant virtue as we understand it, but it is interesting that all these years later or the word that got put there was the word virtue is what I was trying to say. And I, and I am grateful that you, you did expand upon that. Um, uh, let's Sarah Peterson, this, she's five twenty eight. The story of the woman with the bleeding recently became very real to me. I'll share a bit of personal testimony in December. My husband, Cameron, and I suffered a miscarriage during the same time, Cameron's job changed and removed and have been without medical insurance. Apparently you are only supposed to bleed for a few days to a couple of weeks after a miscarriage, but I continually to bleed for almost three months. I couldn't go to the doctor without insurance because we couldn't afford it. I had told a couple of people about my situation who were believers and asked them to pray for me, but instead of praying, they all were just giving me medical advice about things I should do, which were mostly things that we couldn't afford. Finally, when it wasn't stopping, I begged Yeshua to please heal me like he healed this woman, and he did. All praise be to Yeshua. Now to read this, it brings tears to my eyes because I can't imagine how hard it was for this woman to be bleeding for years and years with no help. In this time, too, she wouldn't have had been allowed to go into the temple or anything because of being unclean. She wouldn't have been allowed to go into her own home. Everybody else would have to be out. So, yeah, you make a great point. I can't even imagine that this medical condition was even affected by her, was even affecting her ability to be in the presence of God. But Yeshua was gracious to her and healed her. I think it's cool how it shows the power of a new covenant with Yeshua, that he heals all of our sins and uncleanliness and allows us to come into his presence, which wasn't possible before. Truly amazing. Well, first of all, before I let this go, I want to say thank you for sharing that testimony. And I am I am absolutely grateful that, unfortunately, well, first, my condolences for the miscarriage. I don't want to seem insensitive to that fact that you mentioned that. But I am grateful that the Lord has given you this testimony out of that horrific thing. I mean, not that I would wish this upon you, but I'm grateful for your testimony because now it will be shared with thousands of people, uh, you know, on this, on this, you know, this wonderful EBRT, and he, he's still Yeshua today, and we only need to touch him. Absolute truth. Absolute truth. We just need to come to him, and he heals us too. Amen. Yeah. That's very it. true. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. You want to read? You got yep. to read I got it. Uh, Vicki Richardson, uh, Mark 530. And Yeshua, perceiving in himself the power had gone out from him, immediately turned uh, about in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? I was wondering why Yeshua noticed the power going out from him when this lady touched him. Do you think he always felt power leave him when he healed people? I was wondering if it had to do with her particular ailments since it involved blood. Any thoughts on this? Does anybody say anything? Oh, there's only, okay. You got any thoughts? Um, well, I could speculate, but that's all it would be, so not really. Um, it's definitely interesting that it mentions it. Yeah. Um, I, I agree, I, you know, 
a, a few minutes ago, I was very excited about the idea that virtue had left because uh, it kind of made me think of connecting it to what the Levitical laws considered this yeah. thing, which is a matter of kind of a virtue. Um, uh, but um, being that it's power, um, you know, maybe it simply means what it means that when filled with the Holy Spirit to that level, and performing miracles on that level, you feel the power move through you. Um, and you actually know, you actually know when it has left you and has entered into the person that 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 it's meant to enter into, and you have that confirmation. Um, I haven't experienced that. So, I mean, I haven't experienced to you know, I've experienced definitely a feeling, a a, a, fill, a fullness, of of Holy Spirit to some extent, but I have not experienced laying hands on somebody and having them be healed. So that's why I'm saying, for me, it's only speculation, but it makes sense, I guess. Yeah, my, my experience is, is you can feel it pour out of you when you when you lay hands and somebody gets healed. Ah, ah. I, I have felt that experience when I when I had those. Um, but I understand, I'm not even trying to remotely say that what we experience is what he experienced. I, I right. think that the reason why we might feel that kind of the pouring out in the way we do is because we're being poured into. Right? So if we're being poured into and we're a vessel, basically, you know, as I have given a testimony in my Truth and Free series on YouTube, which is just that, like, we're like, a but we're cups with a whole bunch of holes, sins, our holes and and the and the Holy Spirit will or, or or our relationship with God is depleted by the more holes, the more sin we have, right? And as we repair those holes, as we get holy and we walk more righteous with the Lord, our cup gets more full. We can contain more of that Holy Ghost. And you know, I've I've had those moments where um you're just you're you're literally like if you haven't experienced this, it's gonna sound like baloney, but it's not baloney. You, you can get into what I call the holy rolling where you're just like, you're being as filled as quick as it's going out of you. And like you feel drained. And the Bible does tell us that Yeshua had to steal away from the, from the crowds and he had to go and like recoup. He had to like spend days alone to like, it doesn't say to like recharge his batteries because they don't have that anal that vernacular, that analogy, but like it does say that he had to go and rest up and, and spend alone time and, and go and be by himself. And I do, I am personally of the persuasion that he, it wasn't that I'm going to say he was ever without, but I am of the persuasion according to how the gospel talks about how tired he would get or how, how he seemed like he had to recoup after doing all the healings and dealing with all the people that he, his human side can relate to our human side where we also need to recoup and be filled with the Lord. And it is interesting too, that he does mention this kind of thing when he tells the apostles and again, gospel of John specifically where any, any, and he mentions the washing of the feet. He does say that like, you're going to go deal with people and you're going to get dirty. And all you need to do is wash your feet and you're clean all over. Like your totality of yourself is clean again. Right. So this, it, this moment, if you can go go to the part in John where he talks about washing the feet and talking, and, and you'll see that this ties in with this moment that he's having with this woman, and and uh, it's, it's super amazing. And I do think that there that there is a power that both enters into us that we can indeed feel and will indeed pour out of us. And I believe that you can feel that pouring out. So, uh, and I. Uh, who is to say what Yeshua felt that I'm not even trying to dare speak that I'm just saying that I, it seems to me to be the case that he always would have felt spirit flowing through him. And and I guess that could be the pouring out, but I don't think he was ever. It, I'm tiptoeing because we're talking about Yeshua. So <laughs> I'm walking on eggshells because I know what happened right. about Moses. So <laughs> I'm, I'm not trying to humanize Yeshua at all, but of course he was hundred percent human, hundred percent God. Well, I think, I think, you know, I was, just to say that it wasn't so much that it was a, you know, that the humanity of Yeshua wasn't a weakness, right? Or some 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 lack of anything. The humanity of Yeshua was actually the double triple virtue. The fact that he would allow for himself to have the experience of fully human, which meant, yeah, get tired, 
got to recharge, yeah. got to get away from everybody, uh, you know, so, and of course, and of course, of course, of course, of course, the crucifixion itself. Yes. I mean, that was him surrendering fully to being human. Right. And not, that wasn't him going like, don't you know who I am? Army of angels. Right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Gilda Foss. Did I read the last one? Uh, I the last I, one. I, I read Vicky, so you read Gilda. Okay. Gilda. Uh, I can't help but cry and sob when I read about children in the Bible. Anything about children, good or bad. A story about a sick child will have me weeping. And then I cry even more when they're healed because it gives me so much hope. I have to say these five words in Mark 5, 3, 6 meant everything to me. It summarizes my daily experience and plight in life. If Yeshua said this in the Bible, then he is saying to all of us, right? Be not afraid, only believe. Those five words encapsulate so much of my every day. If only I could not be afraid and only believe, I would be dead. May it be so. Then I could sleep peacefully during every storm. Be not afraid, only believe. Man, that's good. Dina says, so true. I'm definitely guilty of being afraid and doubting during a storm. I automatically go into panic mode, especially when my kids are concerned. How many times after the fact have I looked up and thought to myself, maybe I should have surrendered that moment. The irony is that I am forever praying for the ability to be able to completely surrender moment to moment. And God provides me with the countless opportunities to do so. I let him down. Oh, ye of little faith. Uh, that's what she's saying. I'm not saying that <laughs> to Dina. She, she wrote that in quote, uh, is what always comes to mind when I am in the middle of the storm. I am work in progress. Sisters, <laughs> sign me up to be in that club. I'm right there with you. Anybody else in that club with us? <laughs> I am not only the club, I uh, a member of the club. I'm also the president, you know. We're all presidents of this club, right? Yeah, we're all presidents of the <laughs> club. Of the, you know, of the year of little faith club <laughs> i'm gonna i'm very very quick because that was the last comment thank you you know i have to give testimony to something and and actually really quick this is actually something that ironically has really been on my heart lately in the last like week or so strangely enough you know there's parts of me where i and you you guys have noticed it i'm so box for one second you guys have noticed it when i get like super super frustrated with, with the ministry with how I feel things are going. And, and the reason for my frustration a lot of the time is because I've, I've experienced this other level. And I'm both, I'm both mad at God, right? And I'm mad at me, and I'm mad at the world, and I'm mad at circumstances. And the reason why I'm so angry at the circumstances as, as the umbrella is because I know I have seen I I have I have seen miracles with my eyes as the Bible describes them in the Book of Acts as this is right here I have seen these type of miracles I've been used by the Lord to have my hands lay on people and they're healed some of you have been healed by by the laying of my hands watching this video right now and the thing that blows my mind is like I get so mad that it's just not happening everywhere. And the thing I realized is just as this guy who had the legion in him and he had to be healed and just as this couple who had this child that was sick, like they had to witness somebody go and do this. They had to see it. The apostles had to see it. The apostles had to see that he could calm the storm. I mean, they were even like their brains were like, we cannot wrap our mind around what we just saw. We cannot fathom this. And there's a part of me that gets so mad because we're an online ministry. And I feel like if we just weren't online, if we were just like in a building or in a community where we could just hang out together, you know, I'm confident. I'm, I'm un under the impression to that we would be seeing this stuff happen on a daily basis. And, and by us being separated by time and space, only many of us are only united and joined together by internet connection and videos and comments on a box or the screen. It's, it's so, it's so blessed. I don't want to not give credit to the Lord, but it drives me bonkers because I know how much more there is. And, and so I just want to say like, 
this faith and this kind of confidence, we need fellowship in real life, which is why the last tour was all about like people creating, you know, ministry in their homes and getting connected to the, to the body of Christ. And I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what would come of that. I just knew that's what I was supposed to do. And so we did the tour and it was a blessing for sure. I think we're all blessed by it. But I, I think my human side wanted there to be like a domino effect where people were just having meetings in their homes and people were gathering together in the neighborhoods and like everybody was just basically having these moments that I got to experience with God's chosen men, which I bring up a lot. But basically that's what I was hoping is that people would have these amazing, super powerful, supernatural, real life, Holy Spirit filled moments like all the time. And, and I'm giving this testimony and to say it's really been heavy on my heart, this, specifically this last week. So it's interesting that, that we end this video with this particular thing. I, there's so much more for us to have, guys. Yeshua Network is missing a massive piece of the puzzle. And I'm not going to pretend that it's not. I've never pretended that it's not. I've always been totally clear with you guys that like we should, there, we're, we're missing something in the sense that we're not in physical form with each other. I do believe that the Lord can trans, uh, you know, he can, he can go beyond time and space. I do believe that people can get healed from watching a video that was recorded. You know, if they received the prayer, I, I totally acknowledge that, but we are missing one of the most important parts of, of, of what is to be a follower of Christ, which is this type of fellowship, because we, if we are like sheep, our number one protection is the herd being glued together. And, and when we are together, though, as he says, we're two or three of you together, I, you know, I am there with you, right? Where we're two or three of you gathered in my name, I am there with you. And, and Alex has told me on many occasions, he prefers me to be there with him in person, not, not virtually. He says the, the EBRTs for him are significantly different. I, I feel that. I can testify to that as well, right? But I don't, I don't know what to do about it. And so you will see me have videos where I get angry. And I, and I am, I'm sad. And I guess I'm a man because when I get sad, I get angry. And I'm sad because um, I don't know how to cure the problem. And I'm sad because I feel like my testimony on video isn't enough. I'm sad because I, I can't be there to, to be with everybody all over the world or whatever. And, and I'm not saying I and Nathan Wheeler are important. It's just like, you know, a mother or a father wants to be there with their kids and, and be there in person and not just do a video. I'm not saying you're my kids. Uh, I'm saying that like, you just want to be there in person with somebody, right? And I want to be there in person with all my brothers and, and sisters all around the world. And I want there to be this kind of fellowship because if you are missing, and soapbox ending here, if, if you are a believer and you're like, wow, and you know, Nathan talks about these things or people talk about these things. How come I don't get to experience it? How come I haven't experienced it? Well, that's not necessarily going on in my church, like book of Acts level kind of stuff. Like, where is that happening in the world? Like it is. And it has a lot to do with the, the lack of faith. And the reason why a lot of us have a lack of faith is because we're not in it every day. We're not surrounded by the body where there is for many of us, not a body where many of us are lone sheep. But I am, I am going to just say the truth here that if you can put together a believing body, and it doesn't mean that they have to be so believing that they can touch the hem, but just enough believing people. And if you come together on a, on a frequent enough basis and, and you come together not, not to play church, and God bless that, whatever that is, but, but to come together to truly seek the presence of the Lord, to, to praise him, to worship him, to, to, to grow in him, to be filled with him for the sake of being a blessing on others. Whether, you, whether I'm involved, Alex is involved, or anybody at Yeshua Network is not involved, if you're watching this and you're on the other side of the part of the world, if you can just put together a, a body of Christ and, and you can come together on a very regular basis, the more regular, the more that you, you, you don't have to spend so much energy shedding off the dirt you don't have to spend so much energy pushing away the the attacks of the enemy and the temptations of sin the more brothers and sisters that are gathered together in in a true seeking the lord and and being servants unto the lord it's like a, a herd of sheep the the wolves are less likely to attack because to them it looks like one giant animal right like we know that that's the only defense sheep have is that they looks like a giant blob 
and the, and the wolf doesn't know where to attack. It, it waits for a piece to break off and be alone, right? And the scripture even says that. I, I, he sends the apostles out as sheep for the wolves and, and for the slaughter because they go out with no group. But it's their job to go and build the groups. So I do want to end this with just a testimony that that if you feel there's something wrong with you because you're not having this experience, I'm going to 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 just encourage you and say it's not it's not 100% us. It's our circumstances and it's our environment. We we most humans, at least in America, we don't have truly an environment or people on Yeshua Network scattered in America. I would say because I don't know about the rest of the world. We don't have an environment where we have this holy flowing of belief. You don't wake up in the day and go, I'm going to go hang out with my other holy flowing people who believe that they can lay hands on somebody and that person will get healed. Most of the time you're going to another believer and you know, you're going to go and argue about denominational stuff. There's not the, the, the way you wake up and the way you go to go and spend time with believers is we're going to fight with each other about doctrine and memorization and stuff. And it's, it's disgusting. It breaks my heart, which is again, when you see me get angry on this, ministry you see me getting angry like why is that even happening like why are you fighting over this stuff just go and be a blessing just go and make sure that you get filled with the ghost to the point where you're overflowing with the ghost because if you are overflowing and you're not going out there being a blessing nobody's getting healed and nobody's getting a testimony where they can go and be the guy with the Ouija. nobody's going and going back to their family and friends going yo i met up with these people today and i'm free of all my junk or i have this blood issue and i'm free of all my junk instead it's more like what our sister Sarah said. She went to believers and they said, well, here's a doctor you should contact. If you would have come to me and my brothers at God's chosen men, we would have never even remotely for a split second ever told you about a doctor. We would have just said, sit in the chair, somebody go get the oil. We would have anointed you and we would have believed 100% that at the moment we touched you, you were going to be healed. And we wouldn't have left. We wouldn't have allowed you to leave until you were healed. Like th this is the type of like, thing that is just not happening and i don't know how to do it online so you know i see people saying well let's pray for it but it's just like yeah i want to pray for it but we got to figure out a way to create fellowship in real life we have to create a way where people are gathered together in in this type of body not the normality of what churching is i'm talking about people coming together book of Acts style and i'm not and when i say that too that's a terminology that's used by Many Pentecostals, apostolics, Azusa Street Revival type folks, you know, charismatic types. So that's a whole bunch of Christian vernacular I just used too, if you don't know about that. But they use that whole, we're a book of Acts church kind of thing. And, and that is the church in which I experienced this stuff, or that's the environment I experienced this stuff. But there was there was many things broken with that system too. And and so I, I, I do want to apologize. I'm taking this moment, and I do want to apologize for the record on EBRT. I apologize for my aggressions. I apologize for my anger. I apologize for when I'm hurt. I do not respond always in the most appropriate way. And as, as somebody who's in the position I'm in, that's not a very good thing. I should be better at it. But I'm not, I'm not mad at human. I'm not mad at flesh and bone. I'm, I'm mad at spiritualities and principalities. And, um, and I know there's an answer. And that's what drives me nuts. I know there is a cure. And that's what drives me nuts. I know there is the ability for people to never, ever question again if the Holy Spirit is there among them and wants to flow in them and pour out of them. I know that whether you're a believer or not, if you're in the right environment, if you're with the right believers, the right brothers and sisters who, who have that faith and are operating and living their life that way, a non-believer will walk into that room and will not be able to walk out of that room, not at least saying, uh, yeah, something I felt something holy and powerful in the presence of those believers. And, and I feel that that's super missing. It, for sure, I'm not saying we don't have it in our videos here, but I want to acknowledge that there's more. And, and uh, I hope that if you do come to the meetup in Tennessee, Nashville, that we have that type of experience um, again. And I hope that, that we can pray if you have a solution, if you have ideas, you know, spitball them at me, uh, and many of you do, and I and I often don't respond, um, and it's just because I'd be responding to a thousand people saying that that doesn't work or that won't work for us or for this ministry, and and I don't mean to do that either. 
It's, and I don't want to shoot stuff down. So sometimes you won't hear from me at all. Anyways, I'm also apologizing in, in, at the end of this video because I, I don't ever want a sister to ever say again, I went to talk to believers about my blood issue and they sent me to doctors. Like, I don't want that to happen in this body. I want people to know that they can come to Yeshua Network and pray and, and they're going to be healed because that is that is what happens. That's my testimony anyways. So thanks for letting me rant and apologizing. Oh, hallelujah. Thanks, Nathan. That was um, really good. Um, really good. So... Uh, I, for one, I think, uh, want to pray for, um, for the Lord to reveal, show, make possible for the environments and circumstances to be such that what my brother has just spoken about can become the norm, or at least can be experienced. But I believe, in fact, it will be. I believe before the whole, uh, before his return, it will happen actually. That's just something I, I have faith in. Um, and I think it's going to be exactly along the lines that you say, bro. Um, I will, I will say this real quick. It, the, the, I believe that the environment in which I got to witness it happen had a lot to do with the fact that the people who, who, who had gathered together truly didn't care what anybody thought of them. They truly didn't care if also people didn't want to continue to hang out with them. They, can, they truly didn't care if their family stopped calling them. Like, they truly didn't care, right? They, they wanted God, and they, once they tasted the Holy Spirit, and once they witnessed the power of the Spirit, and it's not about the power, it's about the relationship, but once they witnessed it, they that we all, and you heard me talk about, they all became so addicted to it, and they, they craved it so much that it was like, if somebody in their life was like, man, you're too much, I can't handle you, they were like, I'll try to tone it down, but I'm not going to stop. And I just feel like that's a thing that we have to come up. We have to become like, you know, I'm, I'm just saying there is a formula to the environment. And even among the brothers and sisters here at Yeshua Network, I'm going to, to not accuse anybody, but I'm going to dare say that there's a possibly a lot of us who are like, well, I want to know God. I want to read the Bible, but I also don't want to offend people. And I don't want to chase people away. And that's good. We don't want to do that, I guess. But at the same time, it's like, when... When do we start saying that instead of having friends with my friends that don't believe time and, and experiences with my friends that don't believe whether it's a barbecue or whether I'm trying to think of generic things that, or, or time watching movies with my friends or going golfing or I don't know, knitting or nail salon. I don't know. I'm making stuff. I'm not picking on anybody. But when do we say like, I don't want any of those things. I want more you sure. I want to have a day instead where instead of going and seeing a movie with my friends, I want to go and I want to go and like find all the sick people in our community and lay hands on them. Like when, when are we as literally as individuals? Because it can't be just one person. It has to be like a group of people that come together and we have to actually make the choice in our minds and say, I get that this is not going to make my life easier. I get that this isn't going to be fun and cool for me and all the people around me. But like, like, when do we make the choice? Like, when we turn 90, like, every one of us are going to get to the point where, well, I'm 90, and now I'm old, and it's going to be the next generation, but they don't want to do it because they have to make that choice for themselves. Like, like we made that choice that God's chosen men, and we were young, and we were cool. Many of them were super crazy famous and rich, and they didn't even care. They just didn't care. And I, I just, I'm telling you that, like, that's the recipe is you have to, if you really want this, if you want to see this kind of thing, if you want to experience the best thing and the only thing really worth experiencing in this life, you have to make the choice that this is the environment you want to spend your time on. This is the environment you want it to build your community into. Because if you don't, it's not going to happen. And, and I guess because I'm the one who's been bestowed Yeshua Network, I feel that I've failed you because I haven't done a good job in either motivating you, inspiring you, encouraging you, or showing you how to do this. So I guess that's the thing to also pray on is, is how can we actually make this real? Because I, there's nothing else. There's nothing else. Like if this was happening, which one of us would be upset? 
right? It would be unbelievable. It wouldn't be. We wouldn't be upset about anything. Oh, I missed out on that movie in the movie theater. I missed out on having drinks with my friends at the bar. Or, oh, I missed out on that wedding part. I don't know, whatever, right? Like, it, there's nothing. You're like, yeah, you did that, but I was over here and this person who was a paraplegic, I got up and walked. Like, you're not going to miss anything, right? And I know that the sentences I'm saying sound absolutely, like, insane. You're like, Nathan, really? A paralyzed person is going to walk? His name is Yeshua. He got 39 lashes. I'm telling you the truth. My persuasion is absolutely those things can and will happen when we as human beings surrender to him to the right way. But it can't. It, it, my experience is we, we can't just do it alone. We, we have to do it as a body. God can use an individual, but it, if we really want to actually live this life and experience these things, especially as we enter in the end times, where we won't be able to go to doctors because they're going to pull our medical ability, right? We, we won't be able to go to hospitals unless we take the thing they, they want us to take and we don't want to take it. How are we going to, how, how is the Lord going to do all the healings? There has to be a crazy, passionate body of Christ that's willing to just be like, bam, here's the Holy Spirit. Bam, let me lay hands and anoint you. And then you're healed. And it has to be real. It has to be real because otherwise the Bible's not real. Because otherwise Christ's promises aren't real. And he can't lie, so we know it's real. So the mistake for the brokenness is us. We're the ones broken, not Christ, right? Soapbox done. Thanks, guys. We'll all pray about it. Yeah, I think that's a very good idea. All right, it's three hours almost in. Yep. We've got the comments, we've got the boxes, and we got the soap. Let's get cleaned up, let's pray, and let's reconvene as soon as it is possible. Yeah, wash those pits. Wash those pits. Um, love you guys. Thank you so much about uh, thank you so much for your comments and uh, and reading with us. And uh, um, oh, there's some there's some great comments here at the end. Um, if you guys don't mind, and there's any comment here at the end that you'd love to talk about, let's save them for next week. Copy them down, um, and we will we will talk about them or at them or with them at the beginning of next of the next video. Um, so. Amen. Yeah. Be blessed. Be the blessing. Most important part. <laughs>